And there we go. Hi everyone. Let me know if you can hear and see me. Okay. Um, I should have the mic on, I think, but let me know if you need it louder or anything like that. Uh, we got a little Kubi joining us today. She's very sleepy at the minute. Aren't you, baby? You've been playing fetch today? You've been playing with your ball? You've been having a snooze? It's very tiring work being this cute, isn't it? Yes, it is. What a good girl. Um, I'm going to move the chat just over slightly so I can actually read for you guys. I've got the power. Give me a second. Oh, there you all are. Hello. Here and see you, Gray. Oh, brilliant. Oh, uh, we, oh we have... Um, is that Michael? Is that saying? It's my first time here. Um... <laughs> I tried to watch a video on Verity, but couldn't handle you saying my name each sentence. <laughs> um, I wonder if Rachel's read any obscure self-published authors this year. Um, no, I don't think so. I think they're all pretty mainstream at the minute. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to share these with you. It's been a good year for reading so far. We're gonna we're gonna do a tier list, which I'm quite excited about. I've never done one of those on my channel before, or even for fun, or any time. So we're gonna do that. Um, I've actually got, actually, let me move this over and I can show you my little screen that I've got here. Ah, look, see, I, I prepared for this. Um, we've got all the books down here. We've got my little tier list that I've made. So we have, will read sorry will reread a million times that's like the best of the best we have really excellent really really good would recommend we have these which are like good books but more because they're like an important read and saying something important these are just like yeah i liked it decent but kind of forgettable not good not bad Meh. and then finally burn it burn it burn it burn it isn't it right yes obviously not literally but Meh. There's going to be a couple in that category, aren't there, baby? Yes, there are. If you've seen any of my videos, you'll probably be able to have a hazard a guess what a few of them are. Hello, lucky girl. Hello. Thank you, baby bean. I love you too. Do you want to look at the camera up here? Do you want to say hi to people? Yeah, you're looking. That's how many people love you. Yeah, all these people watching. Oh, see? People are calling you sweet. Yeah, it's pronounced Michael. Love your variety video. Thank you. Rachel says my makeup's pretty. Thank you. I had a bit of trouble with it. I forgot to put any like primer or anything on my eyes. So the colours I've used are like a little bit kind of like faded and washed out. But then I was like, yeah, I'll stick with the pastel look. It's all good. Here's your new boobie. Um, oh, tell me if I'm pronouncing this wrong. But like, Sir Imani says I love your t-shirt. And, and thank you. This is actually my own merch. So if you want to get one of these, you can do from my... Um, what is it? What do I use for merch? Teespring. I've got a Teespring store you can uh, check out if you want. Um, have you ever listened to Young Jesus, the band? If so, your thoughts on the poetry? Um, I don't know the band, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Not very cool when it comes to music. I'm like a massive hipster and I love my like old jazz and funk and soul and that sort of stuff. So yeah, I'm not, not the coolest person when it comes to music. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about the rest of them, but I know where Verity is going to be. Yeah, exactly. So one of the other things I want to say about this list is I've kind of grouped some of them together that are in series. So you might notice here this one. <coughs> Sorry, choking. Um, this one here is a Darren Shan book, and it's the first uh, book in his saga of Darren Shan, Cirque de Freak. I am including the whole series under this because I don't really want to rank each book separately, but I've been on a big reread of that series recently since Alizi interviewed Darren Chan, um, and she was like, oh, do you have any questions for him? And I was like, yes, a million. So she asked him a few of my questions, and since then I've been rereading that series. So that's kind of in there as a whole. And then I've also got the two School for Good and Evil series in here. So I've got kind of the first three books in one and the last three books in one, kind of grouped them together. So bear that in mind as we go through but I'll, like as we go through them i'm gonna kind of like talk you through what i thought of each of them and stuff like that and if you guys have read the books as well then you can tell me your thoughts and stuff sorry i'm just gonna move my makeup remover so it's out of the way and i can read the chat um oh cassandra says what was kyra's favorite book from this year what was your favorite book was it the one where you got biscuits every other page yes the biscuit book the giant book of balls the grand ball encyclopedia yeah Steaks from around the world. <laughs> gorgeous girl, aren't you? You're so gorgeous. <laughs> Not you haven't read more books in four months than I did the whole of 2022. 
the thing is like I am a fast reader so don't let that put you off and also a couple of these are quite short books I'll point them out when we get to them and other ones like a lot of the non-fiction ones are books that I've read for videos and as part of research so I've literally just been like sat at my computer for like 12 hours a day reading and making notes so that's half the reason why I've got through so many books as well so don't don't worry too much um oh Mitchell says I like the duo of Rachel and Elise in that case uh you're like I'm gonna be on another podcast with her hopefully on Thursday we're gonna record it so keep an eye out for that if you like Elise she's wonderful um what's we got going on okay brilliant how are we doing for people showing up give me two minutes to check this out Oh, okay, we got 51 of you here. That's, oh, 59. 51 of the, a number of you. Yeah, this seems good. Okay. In that case, let's start with the first book. These aren't in any particular order. So where do we want to start? Do we want to start with fiction or non-fiction? Also, I think I've got Kyra hair up my nose, so I'm a little tickly. Sorry. This is what you get from being so close to the other snuggle book. Sorry, baby. Too much? Too much? What do you want to kiss? Mm. Are you okay there? You got this. You got this good girl. Mama, get a kiss. Thank you. I love you too. Even if your nose does... No, your hair does tickle my nose. I am starting to think I'm slightly allergic to her fur. I've realised after five years. <laughs> but it's worth it, aren't you? You're worth it. If I get too itchy, I'm going to take an antihistamine, can't I? Yes. All right, baby. How do you feel about having a little lie down for me while I talk about some books? Is that okay? Yeah. Go on then. Off, babes. Good girl. You relax. You don't need to get down or anything. You just have to lay down here. Okay. Yep. Good girl. You wonderful one. <laughs> wonderful. Um, okay, Alice says, shall we do non-fiction first? Mima says, I grew up on books, mostly Jacqueline Wilson books. Now thanks to that, I'm a massive bookworm. Oh, you'll like this. There is a Jacqueline Wilson book in this set right here. So, um, but yeah, like, um, oh, Liam's here as well. Hi, Liam. Uh, where am I? Gabby wants non-fiction as well. Okay, we'll start with non-fiction. In that case, let's start with... Let's go Invisible Women. I'm putting this up here in Will Reread a Million Times because I think this book is fantastic. Now let me go and double check the author because those images are very small. Caroline Criado Perez. Invisible Women, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. I loved this book. Seriously, it's excellent let me just try and pop it over on screen here as well um where are we? here we go so i'm just getting the chat back up i will get organized at some point with this possibly so this book is amazing i read this as part of my research for my why we still need feminism series which i am still working on i'm working on the second video now it's it's a big chunky one it's all about education and work opportunities and unpaid labor and even like biases within the academia system and all sorts of stuff like that. So it's a really, really big video and it's one that is coming together very nicely. It's just gonna probably take me another week or so until it's done. But this was one of the books that really, really helped in my researching that entire series and it's amazing. It's so well written, it's very easy to read, it's very digestible um, and also it's really nice that it, like, it lays out its sources very well, so all the claims it makes, you can then go and fact check for yourself and double check and find more reading materials and stuff like that, which is something I really respect and like in a non-fiction book. But basically, this, this book does exactly what it says, data bias in a world designed for men. So it brings up loads of stuff about how, how do I put this in the right way? A lot of the time when we think about the average or the generic for something, what that actually means is it's designed for the average man. The generic man not so much women so when you think about how public toilet systems are designed there's a reason why the queue is almost always so much longer outside the women's than the men's when you think about for example uniforms for firefighters police officers uh, the army or even just like warehouse works and stuff like that they're all designed with the average man in mind not women these uniforms and safety gear don't fit women properly, which means women are more likely to get injured and all this sort of thing. And it's easy so often for men to look at this and say, well, clearly that means women aren't cut out for X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, you don't realise how much things have been tailored to you. If things were tailored to women in the same way, then, you know, 
women would be in a much better position. We wouldn't be as disadvantaged and all this sort of stuff. So it's really, really interesting. I really enjoyed the chapters on stuff like uh, safety equipment and stuff. So again, a lot of car safety equipment is designed for men and keeping men safe and the average male body, not so much women, which is again why women are more likely to be seriously injured or die in car accidents and stuff like that. There's a bit in here about the inequality in the healthcare system, which then caused me to go jump off onto a whole other thing. I've got a whole video on inequalities in the healthcare system coming out and another book specifically on that that we're going to talk about in a minute. But I think this is one of my favourite ones that I read as part of that research project because it's so digestible, it's so good, it covers such a vast range of topics and it really opened my eyes to inequalities that I didn't even realise that were there. Things that we kind of take for granted, you're like, oh crap, actually, that is sort of disadvantaging us. And I, I really liked that, I thought it was an excellent book. So yeah, that's up there in my will reread a million times category. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a good one to start with, I think. Nice and, nice and positive, you know. Has anyone in the chat read that? I know I'm kind of talking a lot, but... Let me see what you think. Or have you read any similar books like it? I guess a similar one, we can cover it now, would be... Where are we? This one, Unwell Women. I enjoyed this, but I think I was a little burnt out on the feminist stuff when I read it. So even though I probably will reread it at some point, I'm going to put Unwell Women just into really excellent. Again, I thought it was very well written, very well researched, covered some really interesting stuff but I'm not quite putting it in the top category, more because I think of where I was at when I read it. It didn't quite, like, wow me in the same way as, for example, Invisible Women did, but I thought this was still a very, very excellent book. So again, give me a second and I will find out the author for you because there's no way I can see a tiny image like that. I'm also not wearing my glasses, so I need things to be big. <laughs> Um, Eleanor Cleghorn, Unwell Women, Misdiagnosis, A Myth in a Man-Made World. So this one focuses more on the healthcare system and the inequalities in there. And it also covers a lot how it's not just women who are disadvantaged and misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed and more likely to be sent home or their pain ignored or not taken as seriously, but specifically women of colour really, really suffer. They face a lot more stigma around talking about pain. They aren't taken as seriously. There's horrific stories in here of like, um, there was one doctor who she called up um, basically like, the helpline was like, I, I'm a doctor, I'm struggling to breathe, I've got COVID, this is a bad symptom, like, what should I do? I need to come to a hospital. And they tried to be like, no, 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 you can't, there's no interview room, blah, 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 you're overreacting, you're meh, 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 meh. Um, but eventually she's like, no, I'm going to the emergency room. So she goes in, and funnily enough, she was like, tweeting out about this whole thing and like posting about it on Instagram and doing like little video updates as it all went on. And again, she got to the emergency room and they just did not take her seriously. And she's like, look, and, and oh, also like she was a black woman as well. So she's like telling them, I'm a doctor, I'm qualified. I know this is serious. And also well, I can't breathe. And she's like struggling and struggling. So they ignore her, they don't take her seriously. They send her home and she's like, for God's sake, I'm gonna go to a different hospital. So she goes to a different hospital where she dies. And all because people didn't take her pain seriously, they didn't take her expect expertise seriously, they didn't take her actual symptoms seriously, she died. So it has stories like that in it, but it also features like a hell of a lot of like real data and stuff as well. So there's like a lot of stories, that, a lot of stories, a lot of studies that have been done recently into things like heart failure and heart conditions and stuff like that. And um, even though heart disease is one of like the leading causes of um, like death in the world basically, um, it does affect women a lot more and there are certain things where like if, how do I phrase this properly? So when we think of the symptoms of something like a heart attack for example, most of the generic average symptoms are actually the symptoms of how it presents in men. In women, heart attacks and heart disease present very, very differently, which means women are way more likely to be misdiagnosed or just told that, oh, it's just a little, like, you know, <laughs> so, some people are even told, like, you know, they're overreacting, it's not real pain, it's just indigestion, all these different things, and they're just sent home without treatment, which means that 
women are more likely to end up with like serious complications after a heart attack, more likely to die after a heart attack and all these sorts of things. And like the stats prove this. And again, it's even higher in women of color. So this is like a real, real problem in so many different areas. And this book is a really, really good mix of kind of stories about actual women and the stats and the studies that back it all up. There's, I th I'm trying to remember which book it's in, but I think it's in Unwell Women. Um, and again, excuse me if I'm not getting this completely accurate because I'm thinking back to my notes from like a month ago now, but back in, I want to say the early 2000s, there was a study being done into a medication that could help ease symptoms of bad period pain and endometriosis and other kind of menstrual pain and stuff like that. And the funding got cut partway through the study. And the guy who was running the study, he's like, no, I think we're really onto something here. We were seeing really promising results. And he's been trying and trying and trying to get this study up and running again. And people have been like, no, it's not, not a serious problem. Like, we don't have the money to fund this. Like, it's just periods. Women have to deal with them. We can't take this serious, blah, blah, blah. And they're not putting money into it. But this drug has been approved for other things, more serious conditions and it's out on the market for more serious conditions and apparently the more serious condition than menstrual pain is erectile dysfunction because this medication is Viagra. So there's funding to study Viagra for penises but there's not funding to study Viagra for menstrual pain. <laughs> it's, it's just ridiculous. And it's really frustrating seeing all this stuff. And it, mm, yeah, so these books, amazing, brilliant, very important, but, oh God, they make me kind of angry, <laughs> you know? Um, all right, let me look at the chat and see where we're at now. Um, oh, completely, Rachel says, healthcare inequality is one of the most insidious forms of oppression. Could not agree more, yeah. I've been seeing both those come up and plan to read them soon. I really do recommend them, Zach. They're fantastic. Libby says, I love the audiobook. It was amazing. Ah. Um, a couple of people haven't read it. Um, yeah. Alice says, I heard about, for example, medical stuff being skewed towards men. Women are too often ignored. Um, M says, if you haven't already read it, please, please pick up Wild Swans. It's such a massively written book from a woman's perspective in communist China over three generations. Ooh. I have not read that, but I'll look into it. Thank you. There's a Grey's Anatomy episode based on that. Um, oh, was that the story of the the doctor with COVID? Bless her. It's just, it, it's ridiculous. Stuff like that should not happen. It just shouldn't. There's no excuse for it. Oh, that's worrying. Laura says, I've been tempted by invisible women, but the author is questionable at best when it comes to surfery, so I decided it wasn't for me. I was not aware of that. I'm not sure if they're... I'm trying to think if there was any stuff in there like actually covering trans women. I'm not sure now. Hmm, that is worrying to hear. That's not great. Um, I obviously like don't want to be supporting TERFs at all. I actually, um, one of the other books I stopped reading because even though it had some really good stuff about um, women and surviving domestic violence she was so the author she was so dismissive of just trans people existing i was like i can't read this book cannot um i can't remember the name of it now it's in my notes somewhere but yeah um i'm not sure i agree with that from blank the pandemic proved that ethnic minority mortality rates has nothing to do with racism yeah i've got to disagree with that. <laughs> um, one of my friends is pre-med in the US and they're a minority in many ways, racial LGBT disabled. It's amazing how narrow-minded many people in the medical profession are. Oof. Yeah, I can imagine. Come on, it's okay, baby. Shh. Do you lie down, gorgeous? Yeah? Shh, shh, shh. I love you. You just want some attention? Yeah, that's okay. I love you, babe. Um... Exactly, Liam. Menstrual pain is just as important as erectile dysfunction. Exactly. Sorry, I might need to go and get an antihistamine. Give me one second, guys. I'll be right back. Hi, baby. 
Good girl. Hello. All right, sorry, I'm back. Um, I was just getting antihistamines. These are, yeah, they're loratidine. Sorry, my nose will not stop itching. And like I say, I'm pretty sure it's dog fur. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna be gross now, don't judge me. I'm gonna drink from a bottle. It's fine, I live alone, I can do this. <laughs> Hmm. Okay, coming back to the chat. Does anyone mind if I block this turf? The turf's a real feminist person. Do you mind if I block them? I think I'm gonna go for it because this not cool. Uh, it's like that. We don't want any turfs here. I might also remove this person because they seem a little bit racist and also we don't want that so let's get rid of them yeah. oh i need to hear a snort from kyra bless um yeah there we go no turfs no racism here none of that uh let's move back to books and let's move on to something uh okay let's do one that we've covered on my channel 30 life crisis by lisa swartz so, did anyone watch my review on this? She is Shane Dawson's ex-girlfriend. This was a book she wrote about like turning 30 and how she was making her peace with probably never having kids and never getting married and blah, blah, blah. And then the book came out and suddenly she was married and now that she's having a kid. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. It's... I'm going to put it in decent but forgettable because it's not the worst book I've read on my channel. It's not the most egregious. It's got awful humour. It's not funny. It's very crass, which I'm not really a fan of. It's a bit gross in places, which I'm not really a fan of. But at least it's not like some of the others. It's not like outwardly racist, for example. It's not overtly like misogynistic or homophobic or anything like that it's just well because uh, no, no it's not decent but forgettable but i wouldn't burn it maybe i need another category in there uh blech. uh what's the point okay yeah let's add another category in here <laughs> um which we are gonna gonna yeah we are gonna call oops sorry why <laughs> there we go all right, let me change my colors because otherwise it'll bother me. I'm one of these person, Pe people, oh my God. I've had a sip of wine and I'm already drunk. <laughs> I might need to just change my screen slightly as well so you can see stuff. Okay, I need my colors to be right, okay? It needs to be a proper rainbow, otherwise I won't be happy. Um, which means really excellent becomes this. And will we read a million times is gonna become, I don't like this blue, so we're gonna make it pink. Because why not? Now it's more special, and I'm gonna move my camera here to make me a little bit smaller so we can see more of the screen, unless I do this. Where am I? There we go. So yeah, we're gonna put Lisa's book into why? <laughs> because why? <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay, you guys are fine with me blocking those people. Cool, thank you. I appreciate that. Good, good feedback, guys. Thank you. Mm. Wednesday says the joke of the baby, baby reveal party still lives in my mind. It was a odd book. Not quite burnable, but we're gonna, we're gonna pop it there, you know? Ah, part of why I said do non-fiction first is because fiction's better for when we're tipsy. I like your thinking, Alice. I like this. Okay, in that case, we are going to go into... Let's go with We Should All Be Feminists. And I am going to put this in an important read. So this is Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's We Should All Be Feminists. It's a very short essay. We're talking like, what, 15, 20 pages, something like that, about 
why we should all be feminists. And yeah, it's an important read. It reminds us why we should all be feminists. But honestly, I felt like I wanted a bit more from it. Come here, babe. Do you want to come for a snuggle? Come here. Come on. Come to mama. Come to mama. No? What's wrong? Talk to me. Use your big girl words. What is it? You've been out. You've had a snack. You've had a cuddle. You just want some attention. Yeah? You can always come and sit with me anytime you want, okay? I love you. You're okay, baby. You're okay. Sorry, my little bean is demanding all the attention. You see, I don't know if you can see this, she has a huge pile of toys here, and she's still like, Mom, Mom, can we have my tummy, Mom? Mom. <laughs> and, oh, we have Ace of Hearts here. Hey, hope you're well. Oh, lovely, thank you. Hi, we hope you're well too. So, yeah, we should all be feminists. I wanted a little more from it, you know? It made some good points, but it didn't really expand on any of them. It didn't really say much that was new. I've heard she may also be a little bit of a turf, which is worrying. I haven't seen any evidence of that, but you know, it's it's a bit yeah, that makes me not want to kind of promote it a bit more. So, you know, we're putting it there. It's okay. I'd say like if you've got a spare half an hour, maybe give it a read, but don't go out of your way to choose it on, over any of the others, you know? Yeah, that's great from August there. We Should All Be Feminist is a really good beginner read on feminism, but it doesn't have a lot of substance. Absolutely. It's great as an introduction. Kind of leaves me wanting a little bit more still, you know? Should be at least 200 pages, right? <laughs> um, while we're on non-fiction, let's go to... You're all right, Kubi Bear. You're okay. Um, oh, okay, let's go to another one that I think I'm going to reread a lot. Men Who Hate Women by Laura Bates. This was fantastic. I really, really love this book. Again, very, very readable, very enjoyable, but also absolutely terrifying. So she touches on a lot of the stuff that I'm going to cover later in my series and also stuff that I've covered a lot on my channel already. So she covers stuff that I haven't really seen in many other books, like the whole manosphere online, the whole incel culture, pickup artists, um, the alpha males and all that sort of thing. And she covers why they're dangerous and what the real world consequences are of letting these men kind of radicalize in these ways. And it's absolutely petrifying, but it's really, really good and a really important read. And um, again, it's a good mix of anecdotes from like, I was on these forums and I saw these posts and I read this stuff to stats saying, you know, there's this many men doing this and this and they've committed these crimes and done this stuff to them, like, actually her... I think one of the things that shocked me the most was, like, she went through mass violence crimes, if you want to call it that, because, it, like, it's not just mass shootings, but, like, you know, people who've, like, driven cars into crowds and mass knife attacks and stuff like that. So, like, mass violent attacks. She went through a bunch of them and she was like, okay, here's how many of them actually had past convictions for domestic violence. Here's how many of them were involved in posting on like forums and stuff like that. And she went through and you're like, oh crap. Like these online forums that just seem like silly little boys getting angry and like, you know, oh, women suck, don't they? You actually see throughout this book how it gets more and more dangerous and how it really radicalizes these young, impressionable and vulnerable men and how it has real life consequences which usually are violence against real women. And it's it's terrifying, but I think it's such an important read. And again, I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it. It was very different to anything else I read for that video series. And it's one that I found extremely relatable because these are exactly the kinds of people who comment on my videos a lot. When I make videos about like Myron Gaines, whose book we're gonna cover in a minute. And um, when I talk about Andrew Tate and, um, Rouge fee and all that sort of thing. The men she writes about in that book are exactly the ones who are commenting on my videos on a daily basis. And I'm like, yeah, I've, I've seen this stuff firsthand and it's terrifying, it really is. Completely agree with Luna says, you want a feminist, yeah. 
words, see? You aren't a feminist if you don't include all types of women, full stop. Completely agree. Uh, Rachel says I've heard excellent things about that one. Men Who Hate Women is a very uncomfortable book, and I mean that as a compliment, absolutely. I'm almost afraid to read it, to be honest. It is difficult, but I think it's very important and eye-opening and I thoroughly recommend it. And also, like I say, it is a very well-written book in that it's very easy to read and digest and you do kind of zoom through it. So yeah, I thoroughly recommend it for that as well. If you don't want something too difficult to read in that sense, I mean, I mean it's difficult to read in the emotional sense, but like difficult to read in a accessibility kind of way. It's, it's very accessible, that's what I'm trying to say. I do recommend that. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, Luna says, brilliant book. These alpha men are influencing young people into thinking the behavior, that behavior is okay. It's terrifying, but brilliant book. Completely agree. M says, the internet is such a powerful tool that's often overlooked in its role in the real, in its role of real world consequences. Yeah. When I was writing my grad thesis to write about misogyny, I spent a lot of time in those forums and they were absolutely nauseating. It makes me so frustrated when people don't take it seriously. Yeah. Completely. It's, I, I think I've, well, I have spoken about this before, but when I made my first video on the incel forums, the men on there got so upset by my video, they started, like, compiling these lists of information of, like, everything they could find out about me. So they got my partner at the time, they got his work email address and stuff like that. They um, started trying to like piece together from my Instagram posts where exactly in London I lived. And they were like, oh, we've narrowed it down to like this area of London and we've narrowed it down to this and this. Um, if we can find out exactly where she is and where she'll be on these days, well, I'll go throw acid in her face. Oh, I'll go rape her, I'll do that. And it was terrifying. They were like making actual plans to do this stuff because I made a video on them. It's absolutely terrifying and horrible. And luckily the police did take that really seriously, but it, it's just crazy. The thing is, London, so the Met Police, took it really seriously when I reported it. When I've had to report similar things to Leeds Police, they don't take it seriously. And I don't know if that's because Leeds don't have as big a team, because they don't see this stuff that often, so they don't have to deal with it, so they don't know what it's like. But yeah, I do think that's interesting. London though, London police were very, very helpful. I'm very grateful to them for that, yeah. Um, what should we do now? Let's stick with Laura Bates and let's talk about misogynation. So I am gonna put this one in an important read because again, it's an important read, but it wasn't my favorite out of these feminist books that I read. Again, I think at this point, maybe I was starting to get a little burnt out because this was one of the last ones that I read but this was like a series of essays that she's written and like you know magazine articles blog posts and stuff like that all put together in one book all on the subject of misogyny and stuff like that and again they were good but after a while they got a little repetitive and I felt like they're I'm gonna block that person let's not be creepy or objectifying or gross okay like, I'm talking about books. Let's not sexualize me, okay? If you want to talk like that to people, there are sex workers out there that you can go and pay where it's their job to do that and they are consenting to it, but that's not me and I don't want people talking about me like that, please. Back to misogyny. Um, yeah, so this, this book's okay. I wish it had a little more to it. I wish some of the ideas on it were expanded on a bit more. I wish it wasn't quite so repetitive in places. Um, yeah, I just felt like this was everything that this wasn't. Does that make sense? Like, if you have to read one or the other, go for men who hate women. It's, it's better, it's more cohesive, it's a full piece of work as opposed to lots of little kind of not quite fulfilling blog posts and articles, but it's it's good, it's interesting. There's some interesting ideas in here, it's just not the best I've read, you know? Um, let's, let's, let's mix, dip, 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 start that again. Let's mix things up a bit and go for some poetry. I think I've only read one poetry book this year. 
which is not like me at all. This is like full collections. I mean, I mean, I've obviously like browsed through other books and anthologies and stuff like that and read more poems, but this is the only complete complete collection I've read. And it is, um, it is, yeah, it is. It's What is This Thing Called Love by Kim Adonisio. Kim Adonisio, whose name I always struggle to say because it's got far too many syllables for me to get my tongue around. Um, I'm a big fan of Kim's poetry, but I'm only going to put this one in Liked It, because even though there's some really technically good poems in here, none of them were big standouts to me, like some of her collections have. So it's just like a three and a half star read for me. It's not quite up there at the four or five star level. It's good. She obviously covers like things like love and a whole bunch of other topics, but even now I'm struggling to like really think of a poem that stood out to me from it that made me go, wow, yeah, brilliant. Which is a shame because Kim is a really, really good poet, but if I'm remembering correctly, this is one of her earlier collections. Uh, let me have a look. Yeah, this was a 2004 collection, so not her earliest, but not her most recent stuff either, I don't think. Actually, is it her early? No, she's, she published ones earlier than that. But um, yeah, y you can kind of tell she's still finding her voice in it. So I really liked it, but I know she can do better, if that makes sense. And if this was an introduction to her, I'd love it. But because I've already read some of her latest stuff and her other stuff, I kind of know she has this five star level of writing there. And this just didn't quite do it for me. Does that make sense? God, still got itchy nose. Come on, anti histories. They'll kick in eventually. Ah. Um, Cooking with Silence says, what's some adult fiction you'd recommend for a person in a textbook slump? Oh, okay, we can move on to another one of these books. What, well, uh, uh, words. Why am I struggling with words today? Well, I know why. I've been in my home for like three days straight and I've not left and I've spoken to anyone, so speaking is hard. Um, we'll do a fiction book next, so I can recommend a book to you, Cooking with Silence. Um, depending on what sort of thing you like, I've read some really, really good fiction books this year. I think we'll start with... Let's go for R.F. Quang's Babel? Babel? How do I say this? This is easily up there. Six out of five stars. Will reread a million times. I loved this book. This is fantastic and amazing, and I loved it. So... It's set in Oxford in, what is it, like the 1800s, I think, I want to say. And for those of you who don't know, I used to live in Oxford. So it's got a really special place in my heart. And I absolutely love the city. I think it's so special. It's magical. It's beautiful. It's one of my many homes. I love it very much. So reading books that are set there is something I automatically love. But this book was so brilliantly written and it covered so many important topics, and the plot was really engrossing, I loved the writing style, I just, I can't fault this book, it was brilliant. So, it's about this guy who goes to Oxford University to uh, work in their translation department, but their translation department there is a little different to what we think of translation today, because it's kind of combined with magic, in a way, magic, kind of. It's never really called that, but, you know, it kind of is, where by translating words in a certain way, you can get these metal bars to have effects on things, kind of magic effects, but science, but magic, you, you know what I'm trying to say. And it's fantastic. It covers everything from like um, a really in-depth look and critique at colonialism. It covers like all sorts of like etymology, et etymology is the right word, right? Wait, let me Google this to make sure I'm not just saying the right word. God, yeah, it is etymology. I thought I was going crazy then. Yeah, so it covers a lot of like the etymology of words and language and also different languages and looking at like, oh, so like this word. And it, you'll have like whole little pages of like lectures that are just so engrossing and interesting being like, this word's origin was this and this, but in this language it's this and this. And so you put it together and you see that this word is linked to this. And, this. and I'm like, it's fascinating. It's brilliant. I loved it. Um, it also covers like 
a lot of what it must have been like back then for students of different races or mixed races to have to put up with racism and stuff like that. Obviously, back in the real world in Oxford then, students of colour and mixed race students wouldn't have been allowed into Oxford at all. But if they were, they would have faced a hell of a lot of racism like this, despite being incredibly talented and smart and everything. So that's kind of shocking, but in a way that, you know, you have to read it, if that makes sense. I, I... Yeah, August says the magic system in Babel is one of the most original things I've read. It's fantastic. I really, really liked it. And I was worried because, like, I didn't know if they could do the ending justice. I was very worried about where it was going because it was building up and I was so engrossed in this world and I loved it. And I was like, oh, what's going to happen? I was really worried it's going to be a bit of a cop out at the end. But I... I liked what they did with it. It felt kind of realistic, if that makes sense. Um. Babel was my first read of the year and it was brilliant. It will put me in the slump. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of love for Babel in the chat, that's great. Tell me, is it Babel or Babel? Because I don't know. Can you guys give me a pronunciation guide, please? You know you can't trust me to pronounce anything right. I'm from Yorkshire. And also, top up my wine, if that's okay. We're drinking a little Pinot Grigio today. It's just barefoot. It's fine. Californian wine. It's d decent. This is like one of my go-to cheap white wines, you know? It's not one of my favourites, but it's reliable it's decent when the supermarkets are out of my favorites this is one you can always count on it happening you know oh. sorry my elbow needs to crack ah, okay let's uh run through some quick ones on here for now um we have edward gory's uh, oh wait how do i pronounce this word again hang on give me one second and uh, and uh, give me a second Amphig Amphigori. I, why is this so hard to say? Edward Gorey's Edward Gorey's Amphigori. There we go. I'm gonna put this up in really excellent. This is combining Amphigori one and two, and a couple of his other little like bits that I read for the video I did on Jordan Peterson's poetry and comparing it to the work of Edward Gorey. I love Gorey. He's a genius. This stuff is cute. It's light, but it's also dark and like. A bit creepy and just very atmospheric and it's brilliant the man is a genius so he's obviously going up there in really excellent he has to um oh while we're on this subject <laughs> jordan peterson's abc of childhood tragedy is going in burn it because that book needs to burn <laughs> it's so bad how many of you in the chat have seen my video on that book <laughs> Oh, more Pinot Grigio fans in the chat. Excellent. Pickpole de Pinot is my favourite white wine, but Pinot Grigio is a very, very close second. Do you love it? Sasha, you did just hear California. Um, this is a Californian Pinot Grigio. Decent wine. Not too bad. Although, if you're ever in doubt when it comes to white wine, get a French white. You just can't really go wrong with it. All French whites are fantastic in my experience. Um, yeah, but Jordan Peterson, I'm sorry, you're going... Hang on, I'm going to move me up to the other side. There we go. Oh, and then I can make me a little bit bigger. Mm, it's me, it's me. You can see my face now. Deal with it. You can also see my messy flat. Let's not look at any of this or this. None of Kyra's messy toy corner and none of my messy little table. Like, shh, it's not here. It's not you, darling. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is one of the worst books, not only that I've read this year, but that I've read ever. And it's offensive, it's disturbing, it's poorly written, it's terrible. But it did... One second. Oh, damn it, I've moved the postcards through the room, haven't I? I was going to say, it did... Um... 
inspire me to make these like Cairo postcards that um, they've, they've all been sent out now and people should be receiving them really soon. It's a little bit annoying. It took me way longer to send them out than I had planned because like basically I had to mess up with the printing and like things took a while to actually get to me and then I was on holiday when they arrived and everything. Anyway, not the point. Um, yeah, so we made these really cute Cairo postcards with like a little Cairo poem on and Kyra's image in the style of this Jordanson, Jordan Peterson book and she paw printed them all and I hand signed and wrote them all to everyone and it was it was lovely. I really enjoyed making them for people. It was really fun. So I can't wait to see people actually like opening them and receiving them and oh, it's going to be great. Um, Cassandra says I've got to go. Check back in later. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for being here, Cassandra. And don't worry at all. Don't worry at all. Don't, don't worry at all. Why is talking so hard? God. Um, or is a Rachel who threw this awful book in a bonfire? Well, okay, here's here's my dilemma, right? You guys can't see this, but down here, I've got a box and a few bags of stuff that I'm taking to the charity shop tomorrow uh, with my friend Joe. He's going to give me a lift there so we can actually take it all. And I don't know whether to put the Jordan Peterson book in because... <sighs> Let it go, girl. Like, it's, it's just bad. It's a terrible, terrible book. And I want to get rid of it. But I'm like, is it better to just recycle it than give it to charity and have some other poor person buy it? I don't know. I already bought this second hand, so... It's going to go on to someone third hand if I do give it to charity. But then, I don't know. I don't know. That's why we are metaphorically putting it on the burn it pile. But in real life, do I charity shop it? Or do I just throw it in the recycling? <laughs> I really don't know. Oh, I'm sorry I've got such an itchy nose. I really do think it's the Kyra hair. The entire time I was in Gibraltar, didn't have an itchy nose at all. The minute I got home, I was like, Arr. But I love you, baby. Bless her. <laughs> Joey says, don't donate it. Maybe auction it to us or make art out of it. <laughs> oh, Em, I'm sorry. The community posted that quilt scheme scared me so much. Oh, I'm sorry. I quite like the funky art project idea from Joy. Em says it as well. That's an interesting idea. Can we make something beautiful from something so hideous? Hmm. I'm wondering. What if I like, because it's, it's actually a pretty sturdy book. It's in good shape in that sort of sense. So what if I like gessoed the pages and painted over it? Or like collaged over some bits and hmm potential. I like the way you guys think. You smart people. Good job you're here. <laughs> Maybe donate it to a university where they could further analyze how awful it is. <laughs> uh, Peterson AK one one big word salad, right? You can touch someone else with that book. Well, th this is like the other issue I have with certain other books. So a certain person's poetry book, certain Debbie Pearl books, um, another one that we're going to cover in a moment, Love and Respect. I've got these physical copies of the books and they're filled with my notes, really, really snarky notes. So I'm not quite sure what to do with them because I don't really want them in my house anymore. But also, I don't just want to throw them out. But then, oh, I don't know. I don't want to donate them to charity and risk someone reading them. So, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. But on that note, let's cover Dr. Emerson Eric's Love and Respect. Who saw my videos on this book? Because it was, whole, it was a part of a whole series. This one is also going in. Burn it. Burn it now. And burn every copy of it in the world. It is terrible oh my god it's love and respect is the book about how 
Husbands owe wives love, but wives owe husbands respect, and blah, 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 and, um, you know, basically, like, women should be submissive and controlling and all that stuff. It's ridiculous and bad and awful, and there's, like, all these stories online about how this book has, um caused a bunch of people to like being abusive relationships and stay in abusive relationships and all these terrible stories online and yeah well, maybe you can auction them for charity that's not a bad idea actually hmm people make all sorts of art from books or book pages that could be fun to do hmm I like the way you guys think if you send them me I will read the notes you wrote <laughs> <laughs> One of Kieran's favourite things to do to make fun of me, it, like, like in a nice way, not in a nasty way, is um, sometimes like, so when I was, well, I'm, I'm still having quite a big clear out of my flat. I'm doing a lot with the spare room at the minute. It's coming together quite nicely, slowly, but it is coming together. And I'm also redoing the, like repainting the furniture on the balcony, if you guys have seen my Instagram stories. Anyway, I'm getting off track here. While I was clearing out my wardrobe in the spare room, which is where I throw all my, like, you know, like, temporary stuff. Stuff that you don't want to get rid of, but you don't need all the time. So, like, the Christmas tree, the Christmas decorations, books that I bought for videos or that I've been sent for videos or, like, fans have sent me that I still need to get around to reading or I haven't made the video yet or I made the video and I still have to but anyway all that stuff is in that wardrobe and I was having a big clear out and Kieran was like oh what's this book and picked up Dandelion by you know who and he wasn't really aware of all the drama that happened at the time because this was like when we'd first met and obviously like he didn't know who I was when we first met and stuff and he hadn't really seen my videos or anything and so he starts flicking through dandelion and he's like this isn't poetry this isn't poetry <laughs> and he gets to like one of the pages where my note across it is just in giant capital letters because I was really annoyed at this point just not a poem <laughs> across the page <laughs> and now it's the time to wind me up when <laughs> Like if I'm if I'm feeling like self-conscious about my own writing or um, like maybe I, I send him like a poem that like I'm making a video on or something I'm like oh what do you think of this or that he'll just text back and be like not a poem in like how to let us <laughs> and it gives us a real giggle and it's brilliant <laughs> and he's like no seriously I really like it <laughs> but it's just like I don't know one of those things where he just like he makes me giggle. I like it. And he took something that was, that I obviously now have quite bad memories about. And he now makes it into something I can really have a good giggle about. Where he's just like, not a poem. Or he'll like think of other notes that I wrote in there that he saw and he'll just like read them back to me. It's great. <laughs> oh, Rob. Rob says, I'm jealous of people who can read really quickly. I only read one and a half books this year. There's nothing wrong with that. That's why you read at your own pace. You get out of reading what you want to. It doesn't matter if you read a ton or you read one. As long as you're enjoying it, that's what's important. As I said a little bit earlier in the video, you have to remember that a lot of these books I read for work and for my job. So, like, um, out of all of these we've looked at so far, only two of them I read purely for fun. I mean, we still have a lot more fun ones to go, but like a lot of these are ones that I read for work and for videos and stuff like that. So my work day is like usually 10 to 12 hours long and a big chunk of that is often sitting and reading and making notes. So that's why I get so much time to read so much. So don't feel bad about yourself. It's literally my job to do this. So it's okay, it's okay. Um. Okay, let's move on. Do we want fiction or non-fiction yet? I mean, oh, I can do a poll. I quite enjoy doing these, so I can do it now. Fiction or non fiction? Do it, do it, answer the question, please. Yeah, Rachel says, I find most book lo lovers either read a thousand per year or get so engrossed in one it takes them a whole year. The best thing is when you get a conversation between the two of them. 
<laughs> I love that. Oh, all right. While you guys have been on that pole, I'm just gonna go and open the balcony door because I am red hot in here for some reason. Isn't she being a little angel over there? Cutest girl I know. I love you. Bless her. All right, where are we at with this poll? Ooh, 86% fiction. Amazing. Okay, perfect. Let's do a fiction one now. Let's go with, oh, one of the most recent ones I've read. Psycho. This is the book that inspired the Hitchcock film. Who is the author again? Let me double check because uh, I cannot remember. Robert Bloch. Bloch. Bloch, if you're Scottish, but probably Bloch. Um, sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I do that. Bloch. Psycho by Robert Bloch. This is the first one in a series of three books that he wrote, but we're only reviewing the first one here because it's the only one I've read. Hmm. I did like it. I found it good, I found it creepy, I really enjoyed it. But compared to other books on this list, I'm tempted to put it in decent but forgettable. I feel like maybe it's only so iconic because the film is so good. I feel like a lot of it didn't quite age that well either. Like the detective's comments at the end about um, Norman being a transvestite and stuff like that and how that caused him to be crazy and murderous and mm, mm, mm. I do feel like maybe some of it now is stigmatizing people with mental health issues and who faced abusive childhoods and who cross-dress it just well actually I don't even know if you can really count it as cross-dressing because he really believed he was embodying his mother it yeah I feel like maybe that book's not as sensitive as it could be but it's still iconic and it was an enjoyable read it was a quick read it was okay it was decent but kind of forgettable you know um what was oh okay here's here's an interesting one though episode 13 this is one that i reviewed on my community tab i think and this is by Craig DeLouis. Episode 13 is really, really cool. This is kind of like a found footage novel. It's like an epistolary novel, but for the modern world. And I am going to put this in really excellent because I thoroughly enjoyed this book. Probably wouldn't reread it, but really, really did enjoy it and like it and recommend it to anyone if you like sort of horror type stuff. Um, basically, it's about this documentary crew who, they have this TV show where they go to these haunted locations and you have people who really believe in ghosts and people who are like complete skeptics. And they go and they do these investigations and they try and figure out, are these ghosts real or not? And then they go to this one house for filming episode 13 and that's when all this crazy stuff starts happening and the skeptics become believers and blah 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 and all this cool stuff starts happening. It's very reminiscent of House of Leaves. It's very atmospheric. Some of the bits in particular are really, really creepy and properly got under my skin. And without giving too many spoilers, let's just say there's a bit that is very kind of claustrophobic and atmospheric. And I had to get up in the night and put the lamp on while I was reading it because I was so creeped out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very similar to The Blair Witch Project, but in book form and this is the book that actually got me really into this idea of like found footage novels and turns out there's a whole bunch of stuff out there like this book right here so this is a short story collection of found footage short stories so let me see who put this together okay. so this was edited by Andrew Cole, Gabino Iglesias and Oh, they're the editors, the restaurant contributors. So Andrew Cole and 
Gabino Iglesias, they edited, found an anthology of found footage horror stories, and it is fantastic. I would be tempted to put this up here in Will Reread a million times because I really, really liked this. I thought it was fantastic. I read a lot of this while I was on holiday in Gibraltar and it was just brilliant. I read a lot of it on the plane. I read a lot of it after my sister's wedding when I was hungover. <laughs> I read a lot of it after some very, very long hikes when I was very tired. And it was really, really enjoyable. There's, I don't know how many stories are in here. 18 horror stories in here. And obviously there's some ups, there's some downs, some are better than others, and, but I really liked it. And I'm not really one for short story collections and anthologies. I'll read maybe like three or four a year, and normally they're like, okay, they're good, but they're not like top books. Whereas this one, I really enjoyed. I felt they were really creative, they were really unique. I really enjoyed them. I have no complaints. And also the cover just looks really, really cool. It's basically des designed to look like an old VHS tape, which is great. It takes me back to my childhood. Mm. Nightingale says, I love found footage. One of my all time genres. Uh, says, I love that you've been reading some horror. I've been, I've been really into horror films recently as well. I used to love them when I was younger and then just kind of fell out of watching them for a few years and I've been getting back into watching them recently and one of the things I've been loving are found footage horror films so one of my all-time favorite films is Lake Mungo like I think it's amazing and no matter how many times I watch it it still creeps me out like if you got has anyone in the chat seen Lake Mungo it's an Australian found footage horror film and I think it's one of the best films I've ever seen it's so good Um, let's see if I'm here away. Mm. Oh, Rachel says, what were the titles of the last two? And have you read The Exorcist? No, but The Exorcist is on my list of ones to read. I've got it downloaded on my iPad. Um, Rachel, we have, tell you what, I'll pop it in the chat for you. So we have episode 13 and found there we go and found an anthology of fan footage horror um, horror is my favourite genre if you like Spanish fan footage films you might enjoy Wreck I think I've seen that a while ago but I think I've seen that um, and have you read It? not yet, I do love Stephen King but I've not read It yet um, 112263 is one of my favourite films, uh, favourite films, favourite books of all time. I love that book. And I'm reading Fairy Tale at the minute. Actually, I'm listening to the audiobook of that. It's my first audiobook I've ever listened to. And I'm having to take a little bit of a break from it because I find it very hard to, like, maintain my focus on just listening to something for that long, if that makes any sense. Um, but... Yeah, I really, I'm really enjoying that so far. I am wondering whether to switch to like reading the actual book to continue, but we'll see. Um, what other Stephen King do I like? I read Billy Summers not long ago, that was good. Um, Misery is fantastic. Uh, I really want to read Pet Cemetery. I've heard that's really messed up. Anyway, sorry. I was going to tell you about found footage horror films. So I've been watching quite a few recently because Lake Mungo is one of my favourites. So I also ended up watching uh, Creep and Creep 2. I ended up watching... I'm trying to think what else I've seen. Let me Google found footage. Oh, sorry, I'm hitting the mic. Obviously, I've seen The Blair Witch Project, amazing. Paranormal Activity, I think, is a little overdone. Um, VHS, I've seen. I've got the other two to watch still, but I've not watched them yet. The Poughkeepsie, po Poughkeepsie Tapes, I thought that was okay. It wasn't my favourite, though. Um, Unfriended, that was okay. That wasn't too bad. Come on, Angel. Love you. 
Um, not seeing that. Not seeing that. Yeah, like one goes great. Oh, Horror House LLC. I thought that was okay. That wasn't too bad. Um. Sorry, I'm just reading lists now. VHS, last broadcast. Yeah. I've still got quite a few that I want to watch, but I've been really into my horror films lately. I'm, I'm enjoying it. Yeah. I love Misery, you also listen to Fairy Tale right now. Yeah. Yeah, with Misery scared me how realistically inescapable that was. Right? I read Pet Cemetery when I was 15. Such a disturbing book. Wow. Like they've seen X Pearls, Smile, and Scream 6 as far as half decent horror goes. Ah, how is the new Scream film? Because I feel like I've not seen any past, like. I don't even know if I've seen Scream 4. I remember the first few, and I started watching, I watched the first season of the TV series and thought that was really good, and I started the second season and it just kind of lost me a bit. Yeah. No, have I got any more horror books on this list? Oh my god, I've got, I've got the saga of Darren Shan. Oh, we have to, we have to put this up here on we'll reread a million times, because I have. This is my god knows how many rereads, and I have loved these books since I was about what 11 12 years old i think let me see when the first book came out again if you haven't seen alizy's interview with darren shan please do because he's brilliant she's brilliant i will pop a link in the chat and she let me ask questions as well for him so that was really good uh where is Yeah, go on, give that a watch. That was really good. So when did the first... Okay, Cirque de Freak came out in January 2000, so I would have been six turning seven then. I definitely didn't read them then. I got the first three books as a trilogy and then got each book individually after that because they were only just coming out. So I reckon I probably started reading them when I was about nine or so, I'd say. It seems about right, I think. But I love those books. They shaped my childhood. And then obviously, like, I moved on to the Demonata books and his other books. And he's written some books for adults as well that I quite like. Like, um, what's the... <sighs> Procession of the... Dead? Is that one of his? Of them. I've heard that the next execution is good. I've still got that to read. Hmm. Sorry, I'm looking at his Wikipedia page now. Oh, here we go. The City Trilogy. So I read Procession of the Dead when I was a teenager. Um, and he's got two others in that series now that I haven't read, but I do want to. I think I'm going to reread the first one at some point, maybe this year, and then the others and try and catch up on that. We will see. We will see. Okay. Alice says Scream 3 is the worst, new ones are okay. I love Scream 4 almost as much as the first one. Oh, that's high praise. Fair Tales my first Stephen King and I find it boring. I don't think it was a great choice for my first one. The pacing is a little off. It does get a little repetitive in places, which is something I haven't really found with many Stephen King books, except maybe 11, 22, 63 was a little repetitive, but it kind of had to be due to the nature of the book, you know? Fairy tales one I'm struggling with a bit, like I say. I'm literally halfway through and I'm not, I don't know, I'm taking a break. We'll see how yeah, it goes. Sorry, I'm just popping the lights on. There we go. 
Um, okay, what do we want to do next? Uh, another fiction or non-fiction? Let me give you another poll. I quite enjoy these polls, it's fun. Oops. Boop. What are we going to do next? My sister says I always want to try and read some fairy tales. As far as like actual fairy tales go, not the Stephen King book. I love fairy tales so much. They're great. Kieran's just got this beautiful book of Norwegian fairy tales that are all beautifully illustrated and they're amazing. I sat at his on Sunday just like reading through the book. It was great. It was quite fun actually. I was reading all those like stories out to him and doing silly voices. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> hmm. It 2017 creeped me out so much it made 1990 look like a comedy. Interesting. I felt weirdly like the clown was a bit more scary in the original film, but maybe that's just because I saw that film younger and that's stuck in my head as like scary a bit more than modern Pennywise, you know? Oh, Kiltro says, I'd recommend the rhythm. The River Teeth by David James Duncan. It's a collection of short stories. The Garden of Manchester Daughter is quite sweet and daring with a child. Ooh, I like the sound of that. Thank you. Ah. Nettle and Bone feels like a fairy tale. It's great. That is on my to read list and I really want to. It's got a beautiful cover as well, hasn't it? But, yeah. Ah, oh, Grimm's Fairy Tales and some fairy tales. Amazing. Yeah. So good. All right, where are we with the poll? Ooh, it's close. It's close. Okay, we'll end it here. We got non-fiction. What non-fiction books do we have left? Okay, tell you what, let's cover these two together because they're quite similar. So we have, and again, let me get the authors up bigger because I can't quite see the pictures. A little slow. Here we go. So we have Transgressive, a trans woman on gender, feminism, and politics by Rachel Ann Williams. And we have The Transgender Issue, an argument for justice by Sean Fay. These both cover very similar issues and topics in very similar ways. I think. Oh, how do I want to rate these? I'm not sure where I want to put them in the rankings because I felt the transgender issue was better for being better researched and better, um... Oh baby, that is quite a noise! Oh bean! <laughs> Sorry. So the transgender issue was better for being better researched, better referenced, more factual, but it also felt a little dry at times. Whereas transgressive was, some of the stories were a bit more anecdotal and more about personal experiences, but it was also a lot more engaging. And I preferred, let me, who's the author again? Rachel Ann Williams. I preferred Rachel's voice and writing style. I did really like both though, but in different, screw it. I'm going to put them both in really excellent. What do I, mm. No, purely for a writing style, it's going up to really excellent. Because I did enjoy them both. I feel like if you want more factual stuff, go for the transgender issue. If you want more anecdotal stuff and quite a charismatic author, go for transgressive. I don't know, has anyone read those two? Can you, can you chime in? Are you okay, gorgeous? What's wrong? You little grumble pig. Hmm? You little grumble pig. You're doing great. I love you. I love you. Oh, Esmond says, Norwegian fairy tales are amazing. I'm kind of biased there since I was born here. <laughs> amazing. Yeah, the music in the original It film was way eerier. Yeah. It's a pretty good book if you avert your eyes during that scene. Yeah, that's kind of one of the things that sort of puts me off reading it a little bit. King has a way of writing women and children that makes me uncomfortable, to say the least. You know? 
You're right there, gorgeous girl. Are you okay? Shall I get you a little snack? Or just a little biscuit? Yeah? Snack? Come on in. Alright, I'm gonna feed the beast. <coughs> God, my voice went there. <coughs> feed the beast. Give me one second. Come on. Sorry, I'm back. Hello. I'm sorry, the beast needs feeding, and when the beast is hungry. <laughs> if only they were the same book, as I guess the ideal would be a mix of both. Exactly, yeah. Kyra is a goddess as always. Aren't you, baby bear? Yeah, she is. Yeah, Tim Curry is Pennywise. Tim Curry is just amazing in general, though. Yeah. Oh, Rachel, you're so right about Stephen King. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, let's. What have we got left? Oh yeah, which who's this by? Nothing to lose by Alex Flynn. <sighs> this was one I read because I like a circus setting and this was set in like a carnival and this kid runs away and joins a carnival because something happens at home and it turns out there's this whole like domestic violence thing and he was accused of killing his stepdad and blah blah but it wasn't him it was a mum and he's covering it Base or the mum's covering for him I don't know whole thing basically it was decent but forgettable it was just yeah it was a very very quick read it wasn't very inspiring it wasn't really anything special so I'm sorry, but nothing to lose goes in decent but forgettable. In a similar vein, we're gonna go with what once was mine. This is a Disney retelling of Tangled, and these are like their reimagined fairy tales. And love the idea of it; it's great. And this was very well executed. This was like, what would Rapunzel be like if instead of having powers from the sunflower thing, it's like from the moon flower thing, like a whole different thing. It, <coughs> it's a thing. Um, yeah, it's decent, I liked it. I wouldn't quite say decent f but forgettable. We're just gonna put it in liked it. It was good, it was a nice read. It did drag a little bit in the middle. The ending was predictable but fine. It was okay, it was fine. It was a book. <laughs> Kubert demands her dinner. It's you. Although she has already had her dinner. Don't let her fool you. She just demands snacks, don't you? Gorgeous girl. <laughs> Joyce says, Alicia's video every time Stephen King mentions breasts. She does. I remember her making that one. It was... A lot. <laughs> Bless her, I don't know how she does it. <laughs> um, Alright, what have we got left? We've got a few left. Okay, we have Roald Dahl's The Vicar of Nibbleswick. I read this because this is like one of his shorter stories illustrated for kids and I was like, I read this once as a kid but I don't really remember it. Um, and I realise now why I didn't remember it. It's decent but forgettable. I love Roald Dahl, but this book was just like, meh, okay. It exists. It gave me a little chuckle, but it is kind of forgettable. I was like, yeah, take it or leave it, you know? If you want short stories from him, I much prefer his stories written for adults. They can get really dark and really creepy and they're really funny and really witty. And yeah, brilliant. That one just kind of, Missed the mark a bit for me. Not my favourite. Um, what else have we got? We have a couple of feminist books left. Should we do them next or should we do something fun? 
Let me give you another poll. I think I might need to sneeze. Oh. says what are your opinions about changing some words in Roald Dahl books so I actually spoke about this briefly in the video I did on the whole young dumb honey bun leaving the left video uh, let me get you a link to that because she brought that up along with to kill a mockingjay <laughs> I'm sorry I shouldn't laugh at that but it does give me a giggle um when was it this one Uh, Adrian. Shh, no one needs to hear me speak. There we go. This book here. So I spoke about it in that video that I've just popped in the chat. And, um, it's hard because, like, I know Roald Dahl did a little bit of, um, self-censoring himself. He definitely wrote some insensitive things and then changed them when he got feedback. Some of the things I don't mind being changed. Some of them just seem a little silly. It, it's complicated. Can we see what I said in this video? Is that weird? Give me one second. Uh, if this top audio one. Let me see if I can find where the roll doll bit was. I'm gonna see what I said here if that's okay. Here we go. <laughs> That's me. He brings up the whole doll thing, and I have mixed feelings on this. To some extent, I do agree with him. Um, I do think that the censorship of this book was a little bit over the top and unnecessary in places. But the fact she said, and they did the digital tape, they, they did two thirds interviews before, and they listened to the audio book, and I thought, oh, this is a. This is like Roald Dahl. It, it, it. She just simply portrays it as censorship bad. Ooh, the left. Ooh. And it's just too much of a simplistic view. It's too much black and white kind of thing. And then I um, and then I uh, watched a video where I believe Dr. Seuss and another another children's author and um, Roald Dahl. So I think this is the this is actually my book each other. Their books are being edited, and for example, words like fat are being taken out. So in one of the books, I'm thinking of Willy Wonka, the the word enormously fat was taken out, and the word enormous was just left in there. So no one can be described in those books as fat anymore, but they can be described as enormous. I believe the word ugly was taken out, and the word beastie was put in. The concept of editing books that were written a while ago to fit the agenda and the political climate of today is terrifying to me. Terrifying. And I can't imagine why we're erasing that part of history to make it what it is now that's dark to me that is so dark and i don't agree with that and i'm not going to be on the board with people who are like yeah this is great let's let's do that no i no the roll up just before i watch anymore and listen to what i actually said on this can you guys hear that okay is that okay like let me know if it needs to be loud or anything like that i also just Oh wait, that was down. I don't know, like, tell me if that was loud enough, I can make it loud if you need. I feel like now, with what I said about like Psycho earlier, this gives it like a whole new bit of context to me because like, what I said about the whole 
So the police officer at the end of Psycho starts talking about like how Norman Bates is bad because he's a transvestite and he's this and this. And I'm like, that feels a bit insensitive and, you know, blah, blah, and all this sort of stuff. I'm like, well, what if we did slightly change the wording to be more accurate to like what the author intended? But, okay, could you please make it louder? Yeah. Give me one second, see how this is. The doll example is far more complicated than she makes out. Dahl himself was censored and made changes to his books as he was writing them. This isn't the... Okay, see see how that is. Um, and I can go back and we'll watch this bit in a second. But like... I feel like the author's intent in Psycho, for example, wasn't to demonise any kind of person who dresses as the opposite gender or cross-dresses or anything like that. And I imagine they didn't want to make a distinction... Sorry, they didn't want to make a comparison between... Norman Bates and transgender people, for example. I imagine they didn't want to demonise transgender people. I imagine the author wasn't intending for any of that, so... But I can see why maybe the wording in the book at the time could be seen as demonising that. Does that make sense? So I feel like in that case, maybe making some changes to the book to... make the author's intent clear with our understanding of what those words mean today would be better. Or maybe you don't need to change the actual text of the book, just put a disclaimer at the front or something like that, or a footnote or something. I don't know. I feel like as long- You okay? What's wrong, gorgeous? Do you want to come for a cuddle? Come here. Kyra? Come here, baby. Come to mummy. You want some attention? You want some attention? Oh, bean. I might take a break in a second and take her out for a wee and see if she's okay. But I feel like as long as the intention is to make the experience for the reader better and not erase the original content, then it's not so bad. Does that make sense? I don't know. Okay, volume's good there. Yeah, sorry, I had the wrong setting on OBS before. That's completely my bad, but yeah, that'll be good. Um, um, yeah, Joy says, it could also make sense to have an adaptive version with acknowledgements, as long as the original version is available. Yes. I think the old doll thing pushes you over the edge. You're probably just looking for an excuse to leave the live date. <laughs> yeah. I watch Bates Motel and I've been watching every episode, and I actually feel kind of bad for Norman Bates that he's the way he is because of his mother. I feel like an acknowledgement would be better than editing a book post-humorous, hu post-humor, oh my god, I can't speak, you know what I'm trying to say. I have very disrespectful guilt in my opinion, yeah, that's fair. Alright, um, I'm going to take the little one out of the toilet because she's a grumpy grumps, aren't you? Are you my little grumble pig? Are you grumpy grumps? Yes. So I am going to pause this for a second and we will be back in two minutes. Sorry guys, we'll, we will continue this conversation in a minute, I promise. Would you like the toilet, my little baby? Would you? Yes. Come on in, gorgeous. Come
All right, hello, I'm back. Uh, right, where were we? We were doing Rachelception, weren't we? Uh, where are we at with the chat? I mean, there's modern, adapta modern adaptations of the Bible, that's true. I think Eliel Hor actually wrote it, sure it's available. Yeah? <laughs> you grumble pig. Ah, uh, thank you all for your patience there, sorry about that. This my little bee needs to pee. It means she needs to pee, she needs to pee, you know? Um, so I'm gonna, since you, do you want me to like replay the bit of the Young Dumb Honey Bun video that we were gonna have a look at or where are we, where are we at with that? Cause, so you can hear better. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna 1.5 speed it and we'll just go back a little bit and we'll get back to her listening to 1984 and Audible. There we go. Sorry. Still muted it, I'm an idiot. Okay, one second. There we go. And it was very weird because I was listening to it on Audible and there's a, a chapter in which they are basically going back and re-editing articles in newspapers um, in order to make it whatever the narrative is at the time in that society. And then I, um, and then I uh, watched a video where I believe Dr. Seuss and another another children's author and um Roald Dahl so I think this is the dude that came up with Matilda their books are being edited and for example words like fat are being taken out so in one of the books and I think this is Willy Wonka the, w the word enormously fat was taken out and the word enormous was just left in there so no one can be described in those books as fat anymore but they can be described as enormous I believe the word ugly was taken out and the word beastly was put in the concept of editing books that were written a while ago to fit the agenda and the political climate of today is terrifying to me terrifying and i can't imagine why we're erasing that part of history to make it what it is now that's dark to me that is so dark and i don't agree with that and i'm not going to be on the board with people who are like yeah this is great let's let's do that no i know the role doll example is far more complicated than she makes out doll himself mm. was censored and made changes to his books as he was writing them this isn't the first time he's had his work changed or edited or censored if you want to put it like that. As one article points out, this isn't the first time Dahl's stories have been edited to remove offensive material. The iconic singing, dancing umpalumpas of Wonka's chocolate factory were originally described as African pygmy people whom Wonka smuggled out of Africa in crates. In a 1973 revision of the book, Dahl rewrote the umpalumpas as fantastical creatures akin to pixies or dwarves. See, this has happened before and I don't think that was a bad choice. I don't think that was stifling him. I think this is just a matter of making the books more palatable, less offensive. I mean, like as the article goes on to say, nothing was lost in this change aside from a racist caricature, although it's notable that Dahl himself chose to make the edit. However, there are some of the recent edits that I do just that's a good point like and also sorry i'm just going to respond to the chat there we have jay here so hi thank you for being here and joy is heading off as well so thank you again for being here and it was lovely to see you um or speak to you or you know what i'm trying to say um yeah i think hi gorgeous you got this i think the idea of like we need to ask what is lost when we talk about like these edits and stuff i think this was a point i could have expanded on a little bit more like so in this case Dahl making this edit himself to get rid of a racist caricature. Clearly that's not losing any of the original magic. That's not a big loss, right? But when it comes to something smaller, like, you know, editing the word fat to enormous, we have to ask what's really lost and what's really gained. Is there really anything? I don't know. So if it comes to like, maybe like getting rid of racist language or homophobic language or transphobic language or something like that in a book then is it really bad to get rid of it i don't um, hmm i kind of think not but also like I, I don't think there's like a blanket response to this where like it's definitely not a case where it's all okay and none of it's okay you have to look a bit, look at it on a case by case basis, don't you? Frogbog says, "I don't. I just think children don't have the critical thinking skills to question bigotry in books, so they should not be exposed to it uncritically. So I think any changes are justified for kids' books. That's a fantastic point." And Rachel says, "I don't think all the changes to doll books were overly necessary, but I think her criticism that they changed the narrative is unfair." Yeah, absolutely. So I, I do go on and talk about this a little bit more. I think so. I'm gonna let past me speak. Also, I was far more put together in that video than I am today. 
disagree with, such as uh, this change from The Witches, for example. There's nothing particularly wrong with the new line here, it just seems to miss the point of the first line, which was, you can't go around pulling the hair of every lady you meet, even if she is wearing gloves. Just try it and see what happens. I think by changing this, you're removing the point of it, you know? It gets kids thinking critically for themselves and asking, well, why can't I? And then they start thinking and understanding themselves. Well, what are some of the reasons why people might wear wigs? Why did they do this? Why is this okay? It completely normalizes the act of wearing wigs. It makes it acceptable in their head. And then they get that little joke at the end where, you know, kids can have a giggle at the thought of a naughty kid being told off or scolded for doing something wrong, you know? Critical thinking and then a little giggly joke. You don't get that in the edited version and that's what I think it's missing and lacking. That said, there are some edits that aren't so bad. Like I think the ones in Matilda changing some of the authors and books she read. I don't see this as problematic. I think it still inspires a love of books. It just makes the books a little more relevant to today. Not a big deal. Others like... Yeah, so I don't know if you noticed those changes there with Matilda. They removed Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness to uh, Jane Austen what was it was it Pride and Prejudice I can't remember which I don't really have an issue with I oh, it's a long long time since I read Heart of Darkness I was like 17 I think but doesn't it have like undertones of sort of like colonialism and sort of like racist stereotypes of indigenous people if I'm thinking right which is why I can see why that's maybe not the best thing to recommend to kids you know that one again I don't have an issue with them changing um, even if they just wanted to like... Okay, so here's, here's a less serious example of something they've done. Um, has anyone here read the Pretty Little Liars books? Because I, I used to be a big fan of the TV series, very disappointed with that last series, a season. Whew, that whole thing. Anyway, I have thoughts. But big, big Pretty Little Liars fan. And I read a few of the books as well when I was like 22-ish. And I think what they've done is in the last like couple of years, they've re-released a whole bunch of the books with updated references. Now this is slightly different because Sarah Shepard who wrote them herself, she's the one who okayed all these references being changed. But things like, um, cause obviously like A communicates a lot via text and phone and stuff like that. And um, we have Ward joining us. So hi, hi, hello, sorry. Um, so A communicates a lot via text and stuff like that and the phone and obviously technology's changed a lot in the last like 10-15 years since those books were published. So the way A communicates with the girls has changed I think in the updated books, references to things on Twitter, TikTok, certain celebrities and stuff like that, that's been updated in the new book. So the story is still the same, the plot is still the same, it just feels like it's set in today's world rather than 15 years ago when tech was very different, you know? So that's another change that's been made to books that the author was okay with that I don't think is necessarily a bad thing, although it caused a little drama with some people, you know? I don't know. Books being read by children is a separate issue, but in terms of books read by adults, I think historical context adds something. It's interesting to see how attitudes change over time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with certain books written for adults, I think it's okay sometimes to have problematic stuff in those books as long as it's shown in context. Does that make sense? I don't, I don't think bad things in books are necessarily bad in general. It's the context of it that matters. So I'm actually working on a video at the minute about like books told from the villain's perspectives and how sometimes that can work really, really well. So, um, I've reviewed a lot of books like Verity on my channel and the Harrow Fair books and stuff like that. And a lot of those books romanticize the villains. They romanticize abusive behavior. They romanticize dangerous behavior and dangerous relationships and relationships where the women are treated badly. These are seen as like aspirational. And that I think is an issue and a problem because of the context. Whereas when you have a book like John Files is the Collector, which is at least two thirds of it is told from the villain's perspective and he doesn't see what he's doing as wrong. He doesn't see himself as the bad guy. He thinks he's doing the right thing. He's, you know, looking after this nice girl. He just wants to treat her right and, and all this stuff. Um, but throughout it all, you can tell that John Fowles is not on his side. He believes the character's on his side, but the author isn't. And the author 
is still very critical of him while telling the story from his perspective. Does that make sense? So the context of the book matters. He's still very much the villain and he's meant to be the villain and he's written as the villain, even though he himself as a character doesn't see himself as a villain. Whereas in something like Verity, Loan is very clearly the villain to the reader, but Colleen Hoover, the author, doesn't see her as the villain and she doesn't see herself as the villain. And that's why the whole thing is problematic. Does that make any sense? I feel like I'm jumping around quite a bit, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Rachel says, I think Heart of Darkness is a book you need to read critically and with context. It's definitely not an appropriate choice for children. Yeah, which is why I can see they removed the reference from it in Matilda and changed it to something that is appropriate for kids, or at least more appropriate, you know? Um, Malevolent Raven says, following on from what I said earlier, I do agree children should be exposed to certain things uncritically, but I think they should age appropriately be exposed to them critically. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Kim says, I feel like the Pretty Little Liars change wasn't necessary. It's not a bad thing, but I think it's interesting to have that older setting if it's not written or supposed to be set today. I think that's fair. I think mostly it's a change that wasn't necessary, but now that it has been done, it's not a bad thing. Does that make sense? Like, it's not something where I'm like, oh, yes, this needed to be done, but also now it hasn't been done. I'm like, that's fine doesn't bother me it doesn't really change the story clearly they were just trying to appeal to a younger audience today and a more modern audience and if it works for them it's fine i think there are worse problems in those books to be honest oh. for example the number of predators <laughs> and also the characters are just like completely unbearable in the books i don't like any of them they definitely made them a lot more likeable in the TV series. <laughs> um, oh, interesting. Sable Eagle says all the Batman stories, aren't they all told from the villain's perspective? Interesting statement. Um, in what way? Do you think that in Batman is in some way a villain? Because, I mean, there's obviously a lot of Batman stories. Some of them are told from the very clear villain's perspectives. Some of them are told from Batman's perspective. Some of them from Alfred's, from Robin's, from Gordon's, from all these other characters. You have a whole host of different perspectives. Some of them are just told from a very objective third-party stance, you know? Like, when I'm watching this happen. But when you say that, would, would you say that maybe, like, you think Batman's a bit of a villain? Because that's interesting. I'd like to hear more about that because I do think there's a good argument to be made for that. Even though I love Batman. <laughs> oh my god, tell me about it, Michael. He says, I still don't stand, Jeremy. What was Colin Hoover thinking? Right? Ah. Oh. Anyway, I think I went on about this for a little bit more, but we've got it quite a bit. So let's go back to our tier list, shall we? And I did put up a poll. Where are we with this? Um... Ooh, you guys want some bad fiction next. Okay. Well, while we're on the topic of Verity, where do you guys think we should put Verity? Now, my instinct wants to say burn it, but the nicer part of me is like, is it as bad as these two? Maybe it should go in Y. Or more like, why? <laughs> Can we do another poll so I can ask you guys what you think? Yeah? Okay. Where did Verity go? Why or burn it? Because I have another fiction book that very clearly needs to go and burn it. And Verity is not as bad as that. But then you compare it to Lisa Schwartz's book. And it's very, very much bad. Do you know what I mean? Ugh. I am leaning towards burn it. <laughs> Lena says there's a person called Verity, burn it. Wednesday says burn it. Rachel says I've never heard my mother complain about a book as much as she did about Verity. <laughs> Your mum's great. She was so disappointed. Bless her. Oh, the poll is like 50-50 though. Ooh, this could be close. Have we got secret Colleen Hoover 
fans in the chat. Is that what this is? Have we secretly got Colleen Hoover in the chat? I did consider like maybe reaching out to her and asking her some questions. Um, but then I realized I tried to do that with um, Catherine Ann Kingsley who wrote the Harrow Fair books and she just completely blanked to me, <laughs> which is fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't think she liked doing questions. <laughs> uh. Um, okay, we're gonna end the poll here. We are very much edging towards burn it. I'm sorry, Verity, we're gonna burn you. Goodbye. Goodbye, Verity. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, now for something a little sillier and lighter. Who here has read the School for Good and, e Good and Evil books? Because I quite like them and they're bad they are bad and there's a lot of problematic elements but they're also quite enjoyable you know um oh let me look at the chat michael says i would say burn it because the way colin hoover wanted to portray Ver verity's villain and jeremy is the victim when we all know that's a lie yeah i get you i get you um Alice of Heart says, I've yet to finish a Colin Hoover video. It's going to be an interesting one. Oh, well, you'll be happy to know there's a second video with an extra epilogue that she wrote to the book that she released as like a new updated version. So there's actually two videos on it. So you are going to be in for a treat. <laughs> but um, yeah, School for Good and Evil. There's a film out on Netflix um, based on these books and or at least the first books. And I watched this and I was like, oh, Okay, well, pretty pretty good. Um, yeah, it was enjoyable, camp, silly, great costumes. I quite enjoyed it. I was like, okay, I might, might give the books a read. So I did. And there's a hell of a lot of problems with them, including the author having a lot of child nudity, which I found problematic. Like the idea that when you change into an animal and you change back to human, you lose all your clothes. And there's a lot of scenes of them like scrambling around naked trying to find clothes. I was like, I could have very much done without that. And I have worries about the author and the way that, spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. They made like Sophie's love interest, this like several hundred year old man when she's like a 14 year old kid. And they were all being like, that was creepy and gross. And I did not like that at all. Um, there were problems with these books, but overall, <laughs> yeah, I really liked them. They were fun. They were easy to read. They were addictive. I loved the whole setting. I kind of wish maybe someone else had written the books about that setting. Does that make sense? Um, because there were many, many problematic elements. Sophie is one of my least favorite characters in all of fiction ever because she's so annoying. <laughs> She did not deserve a happy ending, God's sake. But, um, oh my God, the three witches though, loved loved those three. They were great. They were the best. Loved them very much. Um, yeah, they were great. I would say the. Th so this is like the first three books that I've gotten here. Here's the second three books. These are like the Camelot years. Again. I have issues with them making 16-year-olds king and get married and do all this adult stuff. I have problems with this. But at the same time, it was really good camp fun. And it was silly. And I enjoyed it. And it was great. Um, and also from the films, I loved um, the evil school's headmistress, played by Charlize Theron. She made me feel things. Um, excellent, excellent character. Thoroughly enjoyed. Speaking of actors making me feel things that influence my opinion on books, let's talk about Shadow and Bone. This is another young adult fantasy fiction series, but I'm only reviewing the first book here because I'm currently reading the second one. And... I've not finished yet, so I can't talk about it. But 
me and Kieran watched the Shadow and Bone TV series and I immediately loved it because it has Ben Barnes in it and I have had the biggest crush on Ben Barnes for the longest time and his song 1111 is one of my favourite songs in the world ever and I adore him. So him as a Darkling was everything and it's made me team Kirigan, even though he's awful in the books because Ben Barnes plays him on TV, I'm like, yes, he's got to turn good. He's going to turn good. <laughs> and I am I am poisoned to love Kirigan because Ben Barnes. Why, why do they do this to me? Um, but no, overall, I did enjoy the book. It's a very, very fun read. I did really like it. I think I'm gonna put this up in really excellent because I kind of raced through the first one and really enjoyed it and I went on to the second one straight away and just loved it and yeah we're gonna we're gonna put it up here in excellent the second book I have feelings about one I'm sad it doesn't have more Kirigan two there's a certain character who I'm not gonna mention because there's a twist so I'm not going to name him as such but there's a character who's a big part of things and and he annoys me three why is there so much Mal I do not like Mal Mal is a fuckboy and you can't convince me otherwise we do not like Mal we do not stand Mal Alina and Mal should not be together I would rather Alina be single than be with Mal because also he holds her back. The whole thing is him kind of being like silently jealous of her powers. And if anyone else shows her attention, he's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. meanwhile, he slept with like half the girls in the country and he just expects her to be okay with it. And anyway, we don't like Mal. And by we, I mean me and Kyra because she's on my team. <laughs> um, see in the chat, just Google Ben Barnes. I see what you mean. Rowan loves Ben Barnes. You guys get it. Ben Barnes is a very nice man. <laughs> he is quite funny. Um, me and Kieran have this joke because we've been watching the TV series together and we've only watched the first episode of series two so far. So um, we can't really comment on that, but <laughs> it's quite funny because like I call Kieran's character hot boyfriend and Mal is other boyfriend. Whereas Kieran's like, oh no, Ben Barnes, you mean, oh, Kirigan, you mean bad boyfriend? And with Mal, he's like, good boyfriend. <laughs> and so we wind each other up constantly while we're watching. And he's like, oh, good job, good boyfriend, good job. And I'm like, no, go back to hot boyfriend. He's like, what, you mean bad boyfriend? <laughs> it's great. <laughs> we have a giggle. It's fun. <laughs> yes, thank you, the Mal Hate Club. See? See, Wednesday just googled him, I get it. Exactly. What was the first thing I saw in him? Because it was something. Was it... <laughs> He's not here, apparently. Um... I want to say, was it a film with Catherine Heigl? Or am I making that up? Hmm... Oh my god, he was in Stardust. Oh, but he was young then. Hmm. Yeah, that's not what I'm thinking of. Oh, is that the one? Yes! Jackie and Ryan. It's a film with Katherine Heigl. And that's what I first saw him in. And like, oh my god, he sings a lot in it. And I thought he was amazing. And I just absolutely fell in love with him from that. Yeah. So, if you ever catch me leaving Kieran for Ben Barnes, don't say I didn't love him. <laughs> but no, seriously, he's great. Um, oh, there's lots of Batman and Harley talk in the chat that I'm way behind with. But yeah. Yes. Tyria, you're so right. She said, I feel like Mal is better in the series than the books, though. He is. He is much better in the series. But, so this is where I'm conflicted now, because Mal in the books is way worse than Mal in the series. So that's tainted my opinion of Mal in the series. But Kirigan in the series is way better than Kirigan in the books. So, 
that's positively influenced my opinion of Kerrigan in the books. <laughs> See, this is the problem. You can't put me near a man with long hair and a pretty face. Just gives me bias. <laughs> uh, anyway, should we get back to the books? Uh, let's do these last couple of non-fiction books, shall we? Because we've got a couple left to do. Um, let's start from up this end. We've got Cut by... Um, I can't quite read this. Um, Hippo... Hippo Wardere? I hope I'm saying that right. Um, basically, this is Cut Woman's Fight Against FGM in Britain Today. This is a memoir about female genital mutilation and a woman who she was put through it when she was a child and now today she's standing up against it and she is speaking out for all those women women and girls who have to go through it she is standing up for them she is making sure they're safe she is looking out for them and this is an amazing book i am putting this in really excellent because it is both important and amazingly written it is so emotive i literally had to put the book down at several points and I had tears in my eyes. It was hard to read, but very, very important. And I'm, I'm so sorry, I just saw a comment that I have to comment on in a second that has nothing to do with this book. I'm sorry. I'm trying to say something really serious here, but I just saw a comment. Um, so this, this book is amazing. And the story is so heartbreaking. And what she went through is just, it's horrific. No one should have to go through that. And the fact that millions of girls do every year is inhumane. So the fact that she's written this book and she's standing up for these people and she's doing this work, brilliant. It's a very, very hard read, but it's one that I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend. And it's really excellent simple as that and I'm so sorry but <laughs> Dick Valentine in the comments just put Rio's nightclub Levington Spa the true OG and I don't know the context but yes <laughs> oh my god is Rio I don't think Rio's is still a thing is it well I don't know I haven't lived in Leamington for seven years I was 23 when I left maybe 24 23 24 I was, I was 23 when I left Lewington Spa, but Rio's was an experience. And I don't know the context of that comment or if you knew I lived in Lewington, but it just made me laugh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh my God. Um, I want to catch up on these Batman, ba Batman, ba Batman comments. So where are we at? Um, save what you want. Okay, the film where Rachel reads your comment, you get so excited, you actually smack your mouth off the Oh, bless me. So the thought process started when a Batman universe tabletop role playing game and thoughts about what would happen if our characters got tangled up with the Joker. During one of the sessions, one of the players really went heavily into hypocrisy. How dare you act within the law? I shall permanently remove you from the world. It made me think about it all. So when Joker says, my plan is we kill the Batman, I have a few issues with that plan. For one, you already did that, it didn't help. Every few months, new suit, new pattern like the old. Uh, oh, like the old Dazzle pattern on battleship, battleships. You can't hide that there's a ship there, but you can make it harder to see what kind of ship it is. Batman's suit suddenly has nipples. <laughs> Nobody notices he's short. <laughs> So the Batman is actually one of the Batmen, a group of veterans with terrible PTSD who never figured out what figured out that they weren't safe in their country in the first place and wanted to carry on. So what did the Batman do? Corporations develop new weapons and the Batman test them out on poor people because they can't legally test them on enemies in a war zone. Then those weapons get sold to the military, who use them for a while and sell them to police forces who use them to break up VLM rallies and pride bullet parades, but not against the U Unite the Right Nazis. <laughs> Meanwhile, because Batman had been beating up poor people and posing dramatically, they've been portrayed as heroes. Use of excessive force against poor people is normalised in society. 
If the Joker wants help finding the Batman, it makes sense to map out his response times in order to find his lair. But you try to map out Batman's response times and all you get is land values. <laughs> then you trust why the Joker would hire the Riddler of all people rather than someone like my Ace of Nays character. If you wanted the man in the costume dead, he'd hire me. But that's not what he wants. Kill the man in the costume, there'd be another whether the public knows that one died or not. What Joker wants is to kill the idea of Batman. That's why the Riddler... It's not because the Riddler can kill the man in the suit, because forcing Batman to, ha to fight a Riddler makes Batman look ridiculous and spoils his image. Based on capes in films, the Joker could be running three massive corporations at once, or he could be a senator or governor or even president, but instead he's stuck obsessing over Batman. Why? Because it ticks the Joker off that whatever generic trauma the guy in the suit has. Because it ticks the Joker off. Oh, because it takes the Joker off that whatever the generic trauma the guy in the suit has, it's made him spend his nights wearing black and get into fights and everyone fawns over him. Dot 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 to be continued. It's interesting you should say this because... Oh, wait. While people who've had far worse lives get no sympathy at all and get beaten up and stuff in jail by Batman or police using Batman's discarded toys from two movies ago. Interesting. So it is interesting that you say this because there are a couple of the comics where Batman has essentially, or rather Bruce Wayne has been replaced as Batman and the public don't notice. There's a whole arc in, I want to say some of the New 52 comics, I think, where uh, literally Jim Gordon becomes Batman and he's in this like techno Batman, Batman suit and the public barely notice the difference. There's some where either Batman disappears or he goes off and does something else or he's like fighting with Superman or blah 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 and um, Dick Grayson takes over and he becomes Batman. There's so many cases where other people become Batman and put on the bat suit and the public don't notice. So interesting. Very interesting. Hmm. hmm. Okay, let's see this final few feminist books. We have Hood Feminism by, I want to say, um, someone Kendall. Kendall, Kendall, Kendall. Let me find it on here so I can find the name. Here we go. Mickey Kendall, Hood Feminism. This is brilliant. Um, I feel like I have a lot in really excellent, so I'm sorry. I am going to put this in the port. Mm. No, screw it. It's going in really excellent as well. It's it's a great book. I really enjoyed reading it. This is Hood Feminism, Notes from the Women That Movement Forgot. And it basically talks about why we need feminism to be intersectional. It talks about all the forgotten people. It talks about women of colour. It talks about disabled women. It talks about um, members of the LGBTQ plus community. It's very, very inclusive. It's a great book. Um, ve again, very easy to read, very accessible. It talks about kind of like a lot of... I mean, she's American, so you can't really call it anti-Tory stuff, but if it was in the UK, it would be anti-Tory. It's about making sure people have a living wage, making sure there's social care, health care, making sure people have their basic needs met. It talks about women living in poverty. It talks about people working for less than minimum wage. It talks about all these things. It talks about what it actually means to be privileged. It's very, very important. It's nice to have working class women included in these conversations. It's nice to have women of colour included in these conversations. In the past, when we talk about mainstream feminism, it's been a lot of white upper class women, which is fine, I guess, it got the message out there. But now we need to make sure that, you know, now feminism is known and heard and taken seriously. We're actually listening to all the voices of everyone else and the people who are disproportionately affected and Mickey Kendall gives herself and everyone else a voice and it's so important it's so great and I think it's a fantastic book really really good again one I'd really recommend to everyone it's brilliant <laughs> Hans Cat says what's anti-Tory so Tory as in T-O-R-Y, it's the Conservative Party in the UK. It's people like David Cameron and Boris Johnson and Margaret Thatcher and Theresa May and all that lot. Basically, 
a bunch of private school educated rich kids who grew up to be cis and white and straight and living off their daddy's money and now they get into power and politics because hmm, what else are they going to do with their days and so they get into power as Tories and they do everything they can to make sure the rich stay richer and the poor stay in their place. Margaret Thatcher is the reason that so many mines closed in the north and my family got absolutely screwed over and were kept down and she trod all over them. And then like people like um, David Cameron are reasons why my family's like benefits were cut and they couldn't get social care. And now they're considering, well, they've done things like um, selling off the national rail systems. They are now considering privatizing bits of the NHS, which is just disgusting and horrific and ugh. No, we don't like them. Tories are bad. Tories are very, very, very bad. You know? Yeah, Rachel says in the US the equivalent is the Republican Party. In the in Australia, the equivalent is the Liberal Party. I can't say I know much about Australian politics, but the Republican Party um comparison is quite accurate. But I would say that there's slightly more elitism in the Conservative Party in the UK. There's a lot of like, <sighs> they're all private school kids who went to Eton and they've all got their little in-groups and Ugh. Hmm. Yell says, hi Rachel, if you could, rem if you remember, could you please start describing the images of Kyra slash other pictures you post on your community tab just at the end of the posts? Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. For like people with, um, visual impairments and stuff. Yeah, I could absolutely try and remember to do that. I can't promise I'll be able to do it all the time. Like, sometimes I post things in a hurry, like, on my phone when I'm on the go or stuff like that. But whenever I have time, I'll try my best to include that. Yale says, I'm totally blind and love dogs. I'm always curious about the carrier pics. Aw. Yeah, no, I'll absolutely try my best to do that as much as I can. No worries at all. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. I, that means a lot to have people point out stuff like that and so I know what I can do better. Yeah. I'll absolutely try to do that when I can. But yeah, Tories suck. <laughs> okay, should we move on to... We've got a few more books left. And I think we have to do one more Burn It, right? And we're going to talk about Why Women Deserve Less by Myron Gaines. This... There's not even a question about it. Burn it. Burn it now. Burn them all. Burn it, burn it, burn it. <laughs> Who in the chat has seen my video on this book? Who in the chat knows Myron Gaines? He is one of the co-hosts of the Fresh and Fit podcast where they talk about picking up chicks and making money from like crypto and, and NFTs and like being a bro and like, yeah, she's just a bang maid in it and, you know, that stuff. What do you think? Is that douchey enough? No, who am I kidding? No one says douchey as Myron Gaines. What I find very funny is, um, well, obviously Myron actually replied to my video on his book and he cried about something, I don't remember what, and I was just like, lol, and whatever. Um, and then a whole bunch of his fanboys were all commenting and being like, eh, me, me, eh, me, 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 eh, me, 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 you know, as he does. And, and as they do, sorry, because all his fanboys. Um, and then a bunch of them were like, Oh, oh, just another sad little feminist responding only to the title and not the contents of the book. And I'm like, mate, this is like an hour long video where I quote several parts of the book from the entire book. Like, did you miss that bit? Did you just not watch the video? If I was just responding to the title, this would be like a 30 second video. But I went through and responded to like this chapter and this chapter and this chapter and, and like... I, anyway annoyed me i feel like i lose brain cells even just reading comments from those guys ah oh, that book makes the others in the burn look like masterpieces <laughs> i mean you have a point <laughs> um oh that one i think my brain annihilated the memory of watching it for my own protection i do not blame you Alex says, that idiot. YouTube turns the service prevents proper descriptors. <laughs> the thing about Myron Gaines is, you know, they were the kids in school and you're reading books and now they're trying to write them. Right? 
they were like, ooh, books are stupid, unless I can make money from them. Oh, God's sake. I just... I feel like men, men like him are never going to listen to someone like me. And like when I make videos reviewing those kinds of books, he's never going to listen to it. His really intense fanboys are never going to listen to it. But I still want to keep making the videos because hopefully I can maybe get through to someone who has maybe just found his content and is maybe thinking, oh, he makes a good point with X, Y, Z, blah, 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 or whatever. And if they then do a little bit more research and maybe come across my video and they realize, oh, wait, he was lying about this and this. This was misinformation here and here. Yeah, she makes a point that this was wrong and this is whatever. Hopefully I can stop more people falling down the rabbit hole. Or at least that's what I'm hoping. That's my intention. I'm not sure. We'll see. I don't know. Um, next up, we have Jacqueline Wilson, who shaped my childhood. I love Jacqueline Wilson. Uh, we have her book, Baby Love. I wouldn't quite say excellent, but I more than liked it. So I'm going to put this in an important read. And I covered this book really briefly in the video. What video did I cover it in? Let me just pop to my channel and let me see. Uh, oh, here we go. Feminist... Pun Feminist response to dangerous period bans. I spoke about it a bit in that video. I will pop that in the chat. Provide those kids with this education seen it yet. The best way to prevent. Sh Sorry, that's me talking. So I covered this book a little bit in this video, but basically, um, Jacqueline Wilson talks about this girl growing up in I want to say the sixties, I think, in the UK, and she. So this is a book that was written way after I grew up. And so I read this the other week, like as an adult, you know, and which is weird going back and reading children's books. It's not, anyway, so it's this kid growing up in like the 60s and she's had a very sheltered life. Her parents are like, oh no, you can't go out, you can't do anything. You can't remember. She's had no sex education, no nothing. So then when she meets an older boy, she is 13, I want to say, the character. And she meets this boy who... He says he's 18, we don't know his actual age. And um, they go for a walk together and she, you know, she's like kind of interested in him, but she's not sure. And then he goes in for a kiss. And the next thing she knows, he's touching her and pulling at her clothes and they have sex. But she doesn't realize it's sex because she doesn't know what sex is. And she doesn't know what's happening to her. So she can't consent fully. And you know, all this stuff is happening and she's confused. And she gets pregnant, but she doesn't know she's pregnant because she doesn't know what happened to her. She doesn't know where babies come from. All this stuff is going on and she falls pregnant and then she's shamed. It's a whole thing. And basically I talk about it a lot more in that video, but it really shows the importance of good comprehensive sex education and not just education about the penis goes in the vagina, and the vid but also talking to kids about what does consent mean? What? is intimacy how do you communicate with a partner how do you know you're ready for sex what are the other things other than just penis and vagina sex you know like you need to tell young people about this stuff so they're prepared for when they go out into the world even if they don't want to have sex until much later in their lives even if they never want to have sex even if you know this is something that they've maybe already done or had to deal with because of abuse or something like that it's important that they're educated and they know these things and they know what to look out for and they also know warning signs of abuse and things like that you know so this book kind of highlights the importance of that and shows us what life was like in a world before kids were really taught that stuff and I think it's a really important book so yeah an important read um let's have a look at this uh, she says, hi Rachel, I'm just about to graduate uni in one month, but I don't know if I pass my research and my parents plan to take me to Pakistan next month after I graduate to discipline me and show there's no life without children. But I focus on family history, not family future, and I'm child free, but I don't know what to do career wise because I was forced to do engineering and I don't want to go to uni. I... I'm trying to and don't have any career plans, just genealogy 
and history. That's a tough situation, and I am sorry. Um, It's very difficult. I'm not sure exactly where you're based, so I don't know if I can give you the best answers based on... I, I, I don't know if I can give you the best answers based on context, but, like, you are an adult now, and I'm assuming... Yeah, you, you're about to graduate uni. Even if you haven't passed your resets, that's okay. You can take exams again. It's not a problem. You, you might need to pay a little bit more, which means maybe you get a job on the side and work up to it. That's okay. I, I failed some exams at uni. I failed my first financial accounting exam because, oh my God, I'm not great at financial accounting. <laughs> not in that like stress time setting. I do my own, anyway, not the point. Do my own accounts fine in the real world in an exam setting. Point is, sometimes you fail exams and it's fine. And if you have to reset your resets, that's okay too. And if you you can't reset or anything like that, there are other options and you're gonna be okay. But you are an adult now and you are gonna be able, legally at least, to stand up for yourself and do what you want. And you don't have to do what your parents want you to do. Yeah, Alec in the chat says, do not go to Pakistan, this is important. And I think that's absolutely true. Like, they can't physically force you to get on a plane and go there. Now, I know you might be worried about disappointing your parents and your family and all that stuff, but honestly, your happiness and freedom is way more important. And sometimes it's okay to disappoint your family if it means doing what's right for you and keeping yourself safe, you know? Don't let yourself be forced into a life that you don't want to live. Um, it is hard. It's going to be tough. Money might be tight for a while. But like, hey, especially if you have an engineering degree or at least you got partway through an engineering degree, that's going to put you in a really, really good place to get pretty much any job you want. You know, you can go on and do some really amazing things from that. It doesn't have to be engineering related. You can go into whatever field interests you. And you're 22, so you're young, which means you have time to figure things out. You can try out a few different jobs. You can work some part-time jobs if you want. You can go into different training schemes. You can do some internships. You have time to figure this out. Like you have your whole life ahead of you. You don't have to be forced to do what your parents want you to do. I know that's hard and I know that's scary, but it will be worth it in the long term. Does that make you feel any better? I'm sorry, I know it's difficult. I'm sorry. Yeah, listen to Alec in the chat. They're giving you some good advice. I hope. It is tough. Sometimes I feel like I'm personally not qualified to deal with this stuff. I just have to kind of give advice as best as I can, you know? Yeah. Okay. Also, Michael in the chat saying, I think Myron got triggered by your video because he got his macho man status revoked by a woman. <laughs> Dude's a clown. I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. All right, last couple of books, let's do this. Um, we have Neil Gaiman's chivalry graphic novel. I love Neil Gaiman, absolutely adore him, but this book sadly was quite forgettable. Not my favorite art style. I think there's a lot better from him and, him and his artists out there. Chivalry was not my favorite, I'm afraid. Uh, the Golden Couple is a thriller about a couple going to therapy and there's all this stuff. There's a lot of melodrama, a lot of stuff going on. I would say I liked it. I wouldn't quite put it up in excellent, but it was enjoyable. It was engrossing. It was an easy read. Where can I put it in liked it, you know? So great, great comments from people in the chat here. I'm just gonna throw this out there. Um, Fred says, respect is earned. If people don't earn your respect, don't give it, even if they're family. Family does not earn a free pass. I could not agree more. Great comment from Fred. Um, Alice says, move to Derby, lots of engineering there. And Rachel says, in the US, you can for sure get some good tech 
technician jobs with a partial engineering degree. Yeah, you have lots of options. You really, really do. You do. Um, over here we have one last non-fiction book and we have The Authority Gap. I am going to pop this in an important read because, again, very, very good, covers some really important topics, was quite readable, but didn't quite engross me in the same way that some of these books did. It just... It got a little samey towards the last few chapters and it did feel like it was dragging on a little bit. But there's some really interesting stuff here, especially about how women are treated in authority positions, in politics, in academia, and stuff like that. And it's, yeah, a very, very good read. But not quite this level good, you know? Yeah, Alice says Neil Gaiman's hit and miss. Some of his books are good, some not. I find that. I'm reading American Gods at the minute. Really enjoying that. Really, really like it. Loved, uh... Yeah, Stardust, right? Yeah, loved Stardust. Um, of his graphic novels. Oh my god, I've read so many. I've not read the entire Sandman series, but I've read quite a few. Really liked them. Uh, I'm trying to think what the Neil Gaiman I've read. I've. N oh my god, Coraline. Love Coraline. Uh, I've not read The Ocean at the End of the Lane, but I really want to read that. I've not read Good Omens yet, but I want to read that. I've read some of his short stories, like, I want to say Trigger Warning? It's one of his short story collections. Really liked that. Oh, I've read a whole bunch of his graphic novels and I can't remember them now. Yeah. Oh, we have Dead Cat here saying, what's up, everyone? Hi. Oh, hearts to you too. That's very sweet. We are nearing the end of our book reviews. We are, we are getting here, slowly. Um, yeah, exactly. Alex says, you should never feel bad about failing an engineering exam. I know people failing more than 10 and still graduate. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, Helmut's Cat says, Ocean at the End of the Lane is my favourite book. We read it so many times. Ooh, I'm definitely going to add that to my to read list then. Definitely. I do like Gaiman's writing style. I really do. I find it's just like, it almost sounds like you're just chatting with a friend. It's almost like he's just like telling you a story, which is quite nice. Which I like. Um, all right, this we're gonna do another fiction book, and this is let me find the author. Caitlin Barash. This is a novel obsession, which is a novel about basically a woman who gets obsessed with her boyfriend's ex and starts stalking her and at the same time she's like well I'm gonna write a novel about me stalking her and then it becomes a kind of like novel stalky inception thing inception -y thing it gets very meta it's odd can I maybe read you my Goodreads review about this because I had things to say I had many thoughts are you ready for this are you guys okay if I just read this out to you Okay, I have no idea what to rate this book or how to even begin processing what I read. Firstly, the way it was written was utterly engrossing and I literally smashed through this book in under a day, which is true, I did. The main themes are clearly jealousy, insecurity, obsession, betrayal and self-sabotage and they're the ones I could absolutely relate to, to some degree, which is why I found reading this so conflicting and challenging. I too struggle with a lot of insecurity. I too have struggled with self-sabotage in the past. I too have been betrayed in the past. In fact, I've been, I've been exactly where our narrator Naomi is in the past. My partner lying to me, me and an ex behind my back, that ex obsessing to win him back, me ending up in incredibly insecure and almost obsessively comparing myself to her. That said, I've thankfully never gone to the extremes that Naomi went to never acted as she did, i.e. I never stalked anyone and tried to write a novel about them. I also think I've grown a lot since that time and I'm now, for the first time ever, in a really secure relationship, which led to me w wanting to scream at her the entire time I was reading this book. It's too messy, they're not over each other, everyone is lying, leave and find someone better for you. But I also knew she wouldn't because I felt the same things as her when I was her age. While Naomi's actions 
are extreme and she was completely in the wrong, I couldn't help but still understand her. And my main feeling towards her was sympathy. Actually, now I'm even rethinking that. I think some of the scenes like her stalking Rosemary's new boyfriend and the scene in Rosemary's bedroom, all of that, I just can't support a character like that either. See? It's conflicting. I relate to like 60% of her character perfectly, so when she does the other 40% of absolutely insane unhinged stuff, I just want to shake her and tell her to stop now, please. <laughs> Rosemary was more confusing. I felt like because of my past experiences as the ex, I immediately want to hate her. And then I didn't. And then when it was revealed at the end that yeah, she had actively been stalking her ex herself and trying to sabotage his relationship, I felt betrayed all over again. I also hate Caleb because I've dated men like him. They date you and string you along while not being over their ex. They try to have it all and triangulate and leave multiple women hanging on and thinking they have a chance because they want it all. They betray you and make you unable to trust them or anyone and then act confused as to why you're insecure with trust issues. In short, He's a douchebag and the real villain of this book. <laughs> in response to being caught out lying and Naomi's emotional reaction, uh, sorry, his response to being caught out lying and Naomi's emotional reaction were written exactly as I myself as have experienced them. And it was a little scary because it was almost like reading about it myself. Of course, this book wasn't ever going to have a happy ending, but I'm not sure about the one it does have. It felt like it ended a little abruptly, but maybe that's an accurate metaphor for some relationships too and I wish that instead of Rosemary and Caleb teaming up and being douchebags it ended with Naomi finding finding some self-assurance and self-worth and ditching them all sorry ditching them all and blocking them all everywhere and learning to love herself again conclusion every single main character in this book is awful and does awful things while their actions are exaggerated the emotions portrayed are some of the most accurate to my own experiences that i've ever read and for that reason this book upset me concerned me scared me a little and i found myself completely unable to put it down so that was the goodreads review that i left on this book and um yeah it's a lot it, it's a hard read it's difficult it's weird because, like I say, so much of the context of this book and the other characters' reactions were like, oh my god, this is exactly what I've been through myself. These are things I've experienced. These are people I've known. But then the main character's responses, I was like, I get your emotions. I just hate your actions. Stop it. Stop it. But this was also meant to be a book about flawed people doing flawed things. And you could tell that the author was very aware of that. I mean, just look at the title, a novel obsession. Like, it's it's there. You know that the author knows what each of these characters is doing is wrong. So for that reason, I think it's fine. It's a book that left me conflicted. It's a book that gave me many feelings. And for that reason, I am going to say for me personally, it was an important read. It wasn't quite really excellent but it was an important one that actually kind of helped me process a lot of the stuff that I went through and made me realize that yeah I'm not as crazy as maybe I thought I was because at least I'm not her you know <laughs> yeah okay last couple of books um let's take tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and this is immediately a will reread a million times I love this book. I think it's amazing. I think it's brilliant. It is by someone whose name I can't remember and I can't read on there. Gabrielle Zevin. Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. This is a story of three friends who are video game designers and the story of their lives and relationships is told alongside of the development of video games. So it starts with a point and click text-based video game back in the, I want to say, 80s, all the way up to them making 2D animations, 3D animations, um, MMOs, mobile games, and so on and so on and so on. And like, you see the development of video games in culture alongside their stories, and it's just brilliant and very well written and very well done. And if you're a video game fan like me, this is a book I think you're going to like as well, and I really, really enjoyed it. So my partner works in video game design and I won't say the company he works for but it's a big one and he also makes little small independent games on the side as well so this is something he really really loves and I knew he was going to love this book as well so I bought him a copy 
for, I think it was Valentine's Day. And um, yeah, the entire time I was reading the book, I was thinking of him and I was like, he's gonna love this. I can't wait to talk to him about it. So this, along with Babel, these two are like my favorite books I've read this year. Really, really enjoyed them. And the thing is, I knew there was a lot of hype around them. So I was quite worried they wouldn't live up to it, but yeah, they're good, they're good. And they do. Oh, Little Phoenix Reading says that was my favorite book from last year. Is that Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, you mean? Or um, a novel obsession? I assume you mean Tomorrow and Tomorrow. And Tomorrow. And Tomorrow. And Tomorrow. I'm assuming. Um, it's just, I know there's a slight delay with the chat and the video, so I'm not quite sure where you're up to. But yeah. We'll get there. Um, next up, let's talk about the mysterious case of the Alberton Angels. And we are going to put this in Liked It. I would go a little higher, but it's not quite really excellent. And I wouldn't say it's important. So we're going to go in Liked It. This is Janice Hallett. I spoke about this book in particular in one of my last videos. Let me double check which one it was. Can I tell you in a second? It was either the Colleen Hoover bonus chapter one or the Colleen Hoover what's wrong with you. And I think it was the Colleen Hoover what's wrong with you one. Because we were talking again about like epistolary novels and novels that have like a slightly different crazy format and all that kind of thing and I was saying how like Janice Hallett I loved her first novel uh which was called The Appeal which was all told through emails and texts and stuff like that and but I didn't like how she kept like spoon feeding the plot to the audience or the reader every few chapters or so but she made a big improvement in the mis mysterious case of the Alperton Angels where she stopped doing that and she told the story really well and it was really good pacing and I really enjoyed it so this has really cool elements about like cults and a mystery and like basically there's a thing where like the police come across this like warehouse where like people have been like in a cult and there's like a mass murder of people killed in this ritual killing and the only people who survive are two teenagers and a baby and that's it. That's all that's like released to the public or told or known or any of it. And there's all these secrets kept and like 20 years on or whatever, this journalist is like, well, I need to write a book about this. So let's do some investigating. So her and another journalist start doing some investigating and like what's going on, blah, blah. And one of the journalists gets like really sucked into the case and the cult and like he starts believing that what they're doing is like magic and real and he gets really into it whereas like our main narrator type protagonist is like nope let me uncover what really happened and it's really really cool it's like part thriller part crime part creepy cult thing great really really enjoyed it i would probably put it a little bit higher than liked it but we're gonna do this for now Oh, bless. Little Phoenix Green says, I'll be re-watching this stream because I joined only recently and I'm always interested in your book, your book recommendations. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's lovely. I do hope you enjoy it if you watch it back. Okay. We've been doing this two and a half hours and we have one more book to go. And that is The Vision by Debbie Pearl. Now, have any of you in the chat seen my video on this? Because if so, I think you're going to know where I'm going to put this. <gasps> no. Oh, nearly broke it. Nearly... No, I did not like it. I did not like it. Burn it. Burn it now. Burn it. Bads. The vision is horrific. The vision is poorly written, poorly structured, with the most disturbed characters I've ever read. It is misogynistic, racist, homophobic, I'm not sure if it's outwardly transphobic, but it probably is. It's everything bad about books. It has plot points that go nowhere. It's far too long. The pacing is terrible. The amount of racial slurs, slurs she uses is disturbing. It's like she will censor slur words, but throw racist slurs around like they're confetti. 
an N word here, a J word here. It's disturbing and disgusting, and I nearly merged those words together. It's bad. It is everything bad about a book. But my favourite thing is that the hero, Asher, who is pictured here, does nothing. He literally does nothing for the entire book. And at the end, when you think he's going to do something and he's finally going to spring into action and he sees a house fire and he thinks there's a kid trapped in there, he's like, this is it. I'm running. I'm going to save them. And then he gets kicked in the head and knocked out. And that's it. And that's all Asher does in the entire book. I would say if we're talking about the worst book on this list, it has to be the vision. There's nothing that checks off that many offensive boxes as that does. The best, it's, it's between Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Babel. But if we're talking best nonfiction, I'm probably gonna go the men who hate women, I think, but we'll see. Yes! Oh my god, I'd forgotten about Magdalene. Rowan says poor Magdalene. She's the one who, like, she was mistreated throughout the entire book. She was, like, raped as a child and impregnated and forced to have an abortion. And she had all this trauma and it was all blamed on her. And then she gets HIV and they're like, ew, wear gloves. I mean, not, well, I, I say not quite. There's a lot of misconceptions about HIV and then she dies and it. It's a terrible book. It's absolutely awful. Yes. Burn, baby, burn. You are right, Luna. Yes. So they are all the books I've read so far this year. And they're my rankings. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. <laughs> uh, let's switch back to just me for now. And I am very tired. And I think I have a little bit of eyeshadow strewn down my face. Um... But, God's sake. Um, if you want, we can end this live stream for like the next, I don't know, like half hour or so with a bit of a QA and a if you want. Um, oops. So I'm going to try this Q&A feature. I don't know how it works. We'll see how it goes. Um, <laughs> Rachel says time for my whole paycheck on new books. <laughs> right, uh, can I... Yeah. Oh, the rest of the chat's disappeared, which is worrying. Oh, I can switch between questions, top chat, like, ah, interesting. Okay. Well, let me... Can I open this in a new tab? Can we do that? I can do it like this. Okay, it works. We'll see how it goes. Oh, that's my voice. Sorry about that. Tell you what, I'll keep up with the chat over there. There we go. And we will have the Q&A over here and I will answer any questions that we, or that you guys put up here. So, oh, Luna started us with, what's your favorite book? Great question. I don't know if I have just one. Now, my go-to when I'm always asked this is Jane Eyre because I love Jane Eyre. Um, I think it's brilliant. I love Jane as a protagonist. I love the kind of gothic setting. I love how atmospheric it is. I love seeing Jane's growth. I love the kind of chemistry between her and Rochester. I love the twist of having the whole mad woman in the attic and the whole like setting fire to house thing. I think it's a brilliant book. I think everything about it is great. And I think I probably read Jane Eyre more than most books out there. But most books, out there, I think I've read it more than I've read any other book. You know what I'm trying to say. Um, Babel and Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow will probably be added to my favourites after this year. Uh, what else would be up there in my favourites? I love 11.22.63, as you mentioned earlier. I really like... Sorry, I'm just getting my Goodreads up so I can have a look at some of my books on here. I'll tell you what, let's see what I've rated five stars. Can I do this? Fables as a book series is fantastic. A Clockwork Orange, yes. Fight Club, love that book. Um, this is interesting. Hmm. 
Oh my god, The Borrowers. I love those books. Yeah. <gasps> a series of unfortunate events. These are definitely all up there as favourites. Yeah, definitely. Amazing. So many good, good books. Ooh, The Cutting Room by Louise Welsh. A little bit of an obscure one. Very good, very dark. Love her writing style in general. She's fantastic. Yeah. <gasps> Haunted. Yeah. <gasps> Tamara Drew by Posey Simmons. Part novel, part graphic novel. Very, very good. Very English countryside. I love that. Right. Ooh, this is great. We're getting some really good questions now. Um, I am going to pause this for a second and go pee because it's been a while and I need to. Um, but I'll be back in two minutes and I will finish off answering the rest of your questions. So that'll be two minutes. Thank you, guys. All right, hello, I'm back. Sorry, when the bladder calls, the bladder calls. Um, what have we got? So Veronica says, Rachel, I love your poetry book. Thank you, that's wonderful. Room is one of my favorite poems I've ever read and I don't even relate to it. My question is, why is it called room? Maybe it's a dumb question, but I don't know what it's, it means. That's okay, it's, so it's a bit of a play on words. So if English isn't your first language, this might not be obvious to you or like anyone or whatever, but, um. Basically, it's like, because it's all about using my uterus or my womb, or sorry, rather using a room in my house as a metaphor for my uterus or womb. So it's a play on words between room, as in R-O-O-M, and womb, as in W-O-M-B. So it's like putting them together to be like, room? Does that make sense? It, it's just a silly little pun that I quite enjoyed. So... I hope that explains it. <laughs> Does that make sense? It's like room versus womb to make room. It's a thing. But I get it. <laughs> uh, Tyra says, what video games do you play? Um, so I just finished Strange Horticulture, which I really enjoyed. That was really fun with the whole like plant identifying thing and the creepy cult and the monsters. And it was very Lovecraft Lovecraftian and I enjoyed that a lot. Um, don't judge me, I'm a big fan of Fortnite. I'm quite, quite into Fortnite, I do like that. Um, I like Hades, I like sort of strategy games and planning games and stuff like that. So I like things like City Skylines and uh, Surviving Mars and Stardew Valley, I love Stardew Valley. Um, I'm trying to think what else I've been playing recently. Love puzzle games like Room and um, Oh, what's the Da Vinci one? I would say Hand of Da Vinci, but I think I'm making that up. House of Da Vinci, that's it. Um, I love 
all those games, puzzly ones like that. Just, I'll play most things, really. Yeah. Uh, Michael says, I know you've reviewed some of the worst poetry and poems, but what was really the worst book or poems you've reviewed on your time on YouTube? Hmm. This feels almost mean to comment on. Uh, worst ones. I think Atticus's poems are some that annoyed me the most because they're very clear cash grabs. It's like some marketing bro who's like, oh, I know what girls like because I know Tumblr. So he gets a bunch of pretty black and white pictures that he hasn't taken himself and he puts them alongside like three word poems or like he'll put seven words together and throw some line breaks in there and be like, poetry. And then he tries to be all mysterious by wearing a mask. And you, he's like, oh, I'm a poet. I'm such a mysterious. I think it annoys me. Annoys the hell out of me. And his books sell in the millions and they make so much money because they're aesthetic. And they're designed for sharing on Instagram, but they're not poetry. There's nothing poetic about it. It just, it's a bunch of vague lines. Hmm. Uh, Rachel wants to know, do you ever read drama? Can you be more specific about what you mean by drama? Do you mean like books or like plays or, I don't know, like the, be, let me know what you mean. Yeah. Hmm. Luna wants to know my favourite Shakespeare play. Oh, that's tough. I think purely for the nostalgia of it, I have to say Othello, because I studied it at A-level, and we saw it performed in the most beautiful open-air theatre in the middle of summer, and it was beautiful. My class was tiny at the time, it was six of us, and we had... Weirdly, we had three teachers. It was split across different lessons and stuff, and then one of the teachers left, and it was the whole thing. But, like, they took us over to... I don't actually know where it was. It was somewhere in the middle of nowhere, just in the middle of the countryside. And um, it was just a bunch of us, and Miss Lockwood, Mr. Hunter, and Mr. Hunter wasn't even our teacher, he just came with us, and he was the sweetest man. And we went to see this open-air theatre production of Othello, and we sat on the grass, and we all shared a bottle of white wine, and watched Othello out in the open and it was magical and like when we were studying it we all got really into it and really loved it and uh, we kind of like our class we put on this impromptu puppet show of um of Othello we updated it we <laughs> made puppets we put it on and we were like Miss Cunliffe this is for you it was great I've got let me see if I can find an old Facebook photo of it because I, I saw one the other day and um, we only had this like crappy little point and shoot camera but it was so cute and I mean like I love the play as well obviously it's great but I think for the pure nostalgia the whole experience of studying that play and seeing it and you know like actually making friends with people in my class that was what was really special about it you know uh, let's see if I can find this uh, I don't really use Facebook, but surprisingly a lot of photos of me on here. Okay. Oh, okay, I recognise this. That was my 21st birthday. So we're getting back. Oh, this was my first year of uni. That's me sleeping on the train. Uh, my brother's wedding. God, I look so different. I'm going to warn you, I'm quite blonde in these pictures. Quite blonde. This was our holiday. So me and my sister went away. Oh! This is me as Casio. Do you want to see, like, chubby little 18-year-old me with my little baby face? Are you ready for this? There I am with my little Casio puppet. I was Casio. Um, here we go. And this is all of us uh, with our puppets. This is Gabby. She drew them. 
And here we are putting on the actual show <laughs> under a table. <laughs> we made like a, a little theater out of a cardboard box and, <laughs> and a scarf. <laughs> it was great. But this was, this is our English A-level class. It was lovely. It was great. Ah, good times. Our little puppets. There you go. That's my teenage years for you. <laughs> uh, where with the chat? <laughs> uh, I am just going to switch back to the live chat for a minute so I can read some of these comments and questions. Um, what have we got? Alice loves Jane there. I'm a Wuthering Heights person. Now I get why you're favourite nail games than the ones I found. <laughs> That's funny. Um, oh, okay, Little Phoenix re Reading says, how do you get to publishing a poetry book? I've had my poetry manuscript for a year or two. I've been sending it to poetry competitions so far no look and getting quite down about it. Um, so I decided to publish my poetry book myself, just self-publish, I can show you. But I figured the this was the quickest way to do things for me because I already have an inbuilt audience with YouTube. So I know I'm at an advantage for that reason. Um, and not everyone has that audience that I already have. I have submitted one lot of poems to a journal, which was way above my level. And it was more of an aspirational thing. Obviously I didn't get a reply, that's fine. I didn't expect it. I've also submitted one poem to a competition that I've not heard back from yet because it's not been judged yet. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but this, I just self-publish myself. So it was a lot of work, but very, very worth it. So it was, basically I spent many years writing the poems and then it was all about the editing and putting things together putting them in an order. I also had to add like all my photos and stuff and I wanted the photos to work alongside the poems and be appropriate for that. So I put them in and put the order in for that. And then I added at the end notes on the photos and like little bits for people who might be kind of interested telling them things like where I took the photos, what the meaning of them was for me and stuff like that. And then I added in a little bit about like the cover art and stuff like that. And then I worked on form, some acknowledgements and stuff. And oh, and also what I love about this is I have poems by theme arranged at the end of the book as well. Because sometimes when I read a book, I want to go straight to ones I'm like, okay, give me one for the mood I'm in. So I did this. Um, and then it was working on like formatting and uh, lots of drafts and um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, when they send you like a draft copy, a, you know, I'm trying, oh, I'm very tired right now. Basically, it was lots and lots and lots and lots of editing and redoing and editing and redoing. And there's still a few mistakes in here that I didn't catch. Like, even now I find ty typos. I'm like, oh, for God's sake. I've read this through so many times and I still find them. And I'm like, how did I keep missing them? Which is frustrating, but it's okay. This is one of those things. You can't ever expect to make something perfect when you're basically doing it by yourself, but you keep trying. Um, also, Luna's heading off, so bye, and thank you for being here, and you've been wonderful, and thank you. Proofs! Thank you, Sable Eagle. Proof copies, yes, I got many a proof copy through. Words. <laughs> uh... Rachel says, I'm curious if you've read any play scripts at all, or do you go to the theatre and watch plays? Um, I'd love to hear your recommendations, if so. Yeah, so I actually studied drama at GCSE and absolutely loved it. Um, I got, like, full marks in my exam, and I got the lead part in, like, all the plays that we did, which two of them were, like, bullied children. <laughs> Typecast. <laughs> um, and one of them was, like, this melodrama called Daisy Pulls It Off <laughs> in which I played Daisy who was this like posh private school girl <laughs> and I had to wear this like really hideous school uniform and I had my hair in plaits and I had like this little like straw 
hat. And I had to do this accent that was like, oh yes, jolly, jolly good. Oh, we're going for tea and crumpets. And it was like really over the top and really dramatic and really silly. And it was about Daisy solving some crime where there was like this old book stolen from a library. And I had to lead my my jolly good friends on a on an adventure. And we had to discover this stolen book and capture the criminals. And it was all about like solving puzzles in this like silly melodrama. And it was really over the top and really ridiculous. And it was really, really fun. So I love that stuff. Um, but I also like seeing plays as well. I'm a big fan of musicals. I, I love my musicals. I recently saw Jersey Boys and loved it. I would love to go see that on stage. If we're talking about stuff I've seen on an actual stage though, um, God, I haven't seen anything for a while. I'm trying to think what the last one I saw was. Oh, I went to see The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. That was excellent. Although, <sighs> obviously the main character is autistic and he has meltdowns, like sensory meltdowns. But as part of showing what it's like for him to have a sensory meltdown, it's a little meltdown inducing. <laughs> so you have flashing lights, loud noises, all this stuff happening around you and it's a little much but I very very much enjoyed it and other than those bits it was really good um I saw Book of Mormon a while back that was great saw Hamilton in London that was great oh, loved Hamilton and um, what other things I've seen live I've seen Greece seen Blood Brothers Phantom of the Opera uh I'm trying to think what else now Equus, Equus was great. Alfie Allen in Equus. It's the first penis I ever saw. <laughs> uh, but also great play, great play. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm trying to think what else I've seen. Ooh, The Woman in Black. That was great. The whole theater was screaming. That was really fun. So yeah, I like, I like going to see plays and stuff like that. That was great. Um... Oh, thank you, Alice. This Rachel's book was a good read, can, can confirm. Thank you. Um, I really want to do A-level English Lit. Do you have a positive experience with it? Would you recommend? I enjoy most of English GCSE, but I struggle with the Shakespeare Macbeth part. Yeah, I, I love doing English Lit A-level. It was one of my favorite A-levels. And the first year was a little difficult because I didn't like the books as much. We did 1984, which was great. Loved that. Like, I got full marks on the first draft of my essay. Easy, brilliant, done, fine. And then we also did The Great Gatsby, which I did not like. And we did... God, I can't remember what else we did. I, I don't remember what else from that first year, but I remember I just scraped a B because other than 1984, I did not like the books and I did not enjoy it and I didn't do very well at all. And then the second year, I loved the books. I loved everything we did. We did The Duchess of Malfi, love it. We did The Poetry of John Donne, love him. We did, uh, we could choose our essay title for our main coursework. So I did a comparison of, um, basically portrayals of female sexuality alongside the evolution of feminism. So I looked at Jane Eyre, White Sargasso Sea from the 70s, I want to say. I looked at Grace Nichols's Fat Black Woman's Poems and I looked at Caroline Duffy's The World, World's Wife as like, so you had like pre-feminism, 70s post-feminism, 80s third wave and Caroline Duffy was meant to be post-feminism sorry 70s was like second wave feminism and someone and basically like I did this evolution of feminism looking at portrayals of female sexuality in literature it was great I loved it again full marks easy done exam was Duchess of Malfi John Donne Othello full marks done easy when you love it and you're passionate about it very easy to do well I found I just really enjoyed it. It was great. Um, 
So yeah, that's how I thought like I'd be lucky if I got an A at A level and I came out with an A star because I got literally 100% in everything in my final year. So I enjoyed it. I had great teachers too, really wonderful teachers. Mr. Brooke, Mrs. Cunliffe, loved them. Amazing people. Um, Ash says, I really want to read 1984, is it in libraries? Should be in most libraries, it's fantastic. Orwell is a legend. Actually, I think some George Orwell is free on Amazon Kindle. I'm not sure if 1984 is, I'm pretty sure Animal Farm might be, but it's worth having a look, yeah. Um, recently saw a rendition of The Tempest in my theatre, it was really good. Oh god, I haven't seen The Tempest since I was like 14, but it's cool. Have you played um, Life is Strange Before the Storm? Because they're putting on a version of The Tempest in that, and it really took me back to being a teenager. <laughs> I like that. From Nightingale. I like The Great Gatsby, but I treat it like trashy reality TV rather than a serious work of literature. <laughs> Brutal, but true. God, I just, I don't know. I can't stand rich, obnoxious characters doing rich people things, and that's all I kind of see The Great Gatsby as being. I'm like, you're all just rich and privileged, just sat around doing rich, privileged things, and, and I just, like, I can't stand any of them. I hope they're all miserable. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, I love the Life is Strange games. Really, really good. Amazing. Um, can't wait for this. Oh, how if time? Okay, it's ten. I should think about sleeping soon. Because you feel it. You should it. It's been a really long night. Oh my god, yes, Michael. Have you ever seen the movie Dead Poets Society? I loved it. Oh, it's so good. The thing is, I went into it not knowing anything about it. So when... a certain thing happens to a certain character towards the end, I was in tears. Because I didn't expect it. It made me very, very sad. But I love the film, but I can't watch it very often because sad, sad. <laughs> uh, the Great Gatsby plays a role of some importance in reading Lita and Turan. Ah, <laughs> not the guy himself. <laughs> yeah, I've not read that, but I think it's one I wanna add to my list actually. Hmm. I think, was it you that recommended it before, or was it someone else? The book is divided into four sections, Lily to Gatsby, James and Austin. Mm. Yeah, this does sound like a good read actually. It does. <sighs> For yawn, sorry. There are some parts of Dead Poets Society that haven't aged well, to be honest. I'm trying to think which bits you mean, I haven't watched it in a few years, but you're probably right. Before you go to sleep, I've been wondering for a while already if German philosopher Max Stirner says anything to you. I don't think I know who that is, but I can Google it. Max Stirner, German philosopher, known professionally as Max Stirner. Oh, Johann Kasper Schmidt, known professionally as Max Stirner. Stirner's main work, The Ego and Its Own, was first published in 1844 in Leipzig and has since appeared in numerous editions and translations. Don't judge from pronunciation, I'm terrible. I am afraid I do not think I know this man. Hmm. Have you read Our Wives Under the Sea? It blew me away very recently. I still keep thinking about it. The name sounds familiar. Again, let me Google it. Uh, 
find your chances of reducing your shadow. Oh, I've heard of this. I've not read it, but I have heard of it. Maybe I will add it to my to read list. I uh, just remembered, and even in solidarity with the Iranian people's uprising, with Rachel Maskell and Peter Jork, so I know, have an invitation to everyone to go. Oh, wow, okay. Um, when's the 13th of May? Hang on, I need my calendar. I'm busy a couple of weekends, I don't know if it's that one. Okay, it's my sister's wedding party this weekend. And next weekend I'm seeing friends, the 13th, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm busy that weekend, but thank you for asking me. I do appreciate it. Just this, this month's a bit busy for me as all. Well. I'm sorry, but thank you. <laughs> Financiation's fine. I can understand what you were saying. Also, love your content. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, our wives under the sea. I will add that one to my list. I have so much to read. Why is there never enough time to read everything you want to? On the sad things in the world. That's sad, sad. Also, Kubi Bear is fast asleep. I don't know if you can see her little bottom just there. She's a very, very good girl. She's been amazing. Yeah, I'm sorry, Sable Eagle, but thank you for asking me. I do appreciate it. Oh wait, Sable Eagle. Have I been saying your name wrong all this time? I've read it as like Sable Eagle, but is it like Sable Eagle? Sable Eagle, Sable, 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 please tell me huh, to say your name. <laughs> Life is indeed strange. Uh, would you consider doing videos about British politics? Seems like I never hear about more of the things going on around the pond. <sighs> yeah, part of me wants to, and I do try and like dip it into videos when I can. But I'm also aware that I'm not the most well versed in the ins and outs of politics. Like, I know enough to get by, I know enough to be informed when I'm voting, but I don't quite know specifics of certain things and I don't quite know like you know like oh so and so said this on this day about this and this and this you know I'm more of a when it comes to a local election I'll be like okay what are these candidates saying and who am I voting for and I know the big main policies of the parties but it's all kind of very general stuff I'm not an expert I do think there's better people to be talking about it than me but when possible, I do try and speak about what I can. What I can say is I'll never be pro-Tory. <laughs> because fuck the Tories. <laughs> you two don't like that word, but I can say it in front of Tory because it's important. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Back around the time you were born. I also use an as limited to nine characters. And, ah, that makes sense. So there is meant to be another E in Save Illegal. That makes sense. Look at me. Also, thank you for saying that. You made me feel very young. Appreciate it. I need that right now. I'm starting to, like, feel my age with certain things. Like, you guys can probably see, because I've got a little bit of eyeshadow fallout. I'm like, I'm getting under eye wrinkles. I'm getting little like up here wrinkles and stuff. And like these, these bits getting very deep. But it's okay. It's a part of aging and I'm trying to like accept that. But at the same time, it can be kind of hard sometimes. Like I had a bit, I think I spoke about this in the video the other week, but like it was like 11 p.m. on I don't know, like a Friday night or something. And I just burst into tears with Kieran. We were walking home. We'd been out for dinner. And we were walking home. And I just 
burst into tears and he was like what's wrong what's wrong and I'm like all my friends are getting Botox and I'm okay be the only one to age normally and I'm gonna look ancient <laughs> and I had this whole little crisis because like I have certain like YouTuber friends who've had Botox and now I've got real life friends in Leeds who have Botox and you would be surprised by how many people have Botox and like this one friend told me and she was like telling me about it I'm like oh well looks great on you this is great like and then she was like yeah so like also my sister's got it and then my friend's gonna get it and my other friend has it and then my colleague has it and this person has it, and this person. I'm like so then I started like asking around everyone has Botox except my London friends but I was like am I gonna be the weird one for having like forehead wrinkles and stuff <laughs> but then like the other part of me is like no I want to just age normally I think and accept my body the way it is but on the other hand that's terrifying because I've always been the one with the baby face and I've always looked younger than everyone else and I've kind of grown to accept that and now I'm like am I going to be the one who's just older looking than everyone else <laughs> so it's weird I don't know but at the same time, like, then you have this conflict because 30 is a weird age where certain people around you are telling you that you're old and you need to do and so and so says this and you need to do this and all this stuff. And I'm like, also in the grand scheme of things, 30 is not that old. So, I don't know, conflicting. <sighs> Yeah, I'm with you there, Alice. Alice says I'm voting green on the 4th of May because I can't vote Labour whilst Keir Starmer is leader. Last few elections I voted green and very, very keen to keep voting green. My brother keeps telling me I'm wasting a vote and I'm like, well, if you keep telling everyone that, then you're just going to stick with a two-party system and Labour's going to keep losing to the Tories. But if you actually let people vote for who's decent greens usually then they're in with more of a chance you know like I vote a green yeah I don't think I've voted Labour since the first time I lived in Lewington Spa I voted green when I lived in Oxford and I've been voting green ever since Usually I'm quite open. I'm like, I will read all the candidates and be like, who do I want to vote for? Whose policies do I like? But for the last eight years, it's been consistently green. I just think they're better. Both on an individual level and a party level. I like them. <laughs> okay, I relate to you both there. Little Phoenix Reading says, I'm almost 30 and still feel like a teenager. Whereas Tyra says, I'm 19 and feel like I'm getting wrinkles already. <laughs> I relate to you both. <laughs> I think the thing is, Tyra, we all think our wrinkles are way worse than they are. Like, it's just one of those things. They're probably like, you guys probably can't even see wrinkles that much unless you like zoom in on my face super close. Whereas for me, I'm like, it's there, it's there, and it's obvious, and it's doing this, and then there's, like, I can point out where all my wrinkles are, I can point out where every mole is on my body, where every blemish is, where every blocked pore is, all this stuff, whereas, like, other people don't care. I think we're far more hypercritical of ourselves than other people are, you know? Also, my nose has nearly stopped itching, but it's still going on a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Trent, only three hours late. Oh, Trent. Oh, and we have a baby who says, Good morning in Australia at 7.15 a.m. Damn, well, thank you for joining us. You guys have missed the ranking books, unfortunately, but you can go back and watch if you want. It was a lot of fun. Now we're just drinking wine and chatting, because why not? Um, and also, if you guys want to ask me any questions, I will try and answer. Oh, we have one from Cassie that I haven't seen. Do you read about grief myths a lot? If so, are there any myths or characters you tend to enjoy more? I like Penelope Hector and Ramashi. Thank you. Have a good night. Um, yeah, I'm actually writing a poem at the minute about, like, Icarus, but from 
a kind of personal perspective. So the first line of it is, uh, let me read it to you. It still has a long, long way to go. It's very, very unfinished. I don't even have a full thing I could read to you right now. But the first line of the poem is, my mother never, start that again. My mother never knew the story of Icarus, but if she did, and then I'm not, I'm not going to give you spoilers now, but that's something I'm writing about that is quite personal and I'm going with that. So, um, yeah, I like that one. I am very interested in the whole Persephone, Hades and her mother story. I find that fascinating. Um, I, I know this is like a weird thing, but... I love the Rick Riordan books, the whole Percy Jackson series, and the retellings of the Greek myths in them. <laughs> I know they're a bit cheesy, but I really enjoy them, and they're really, like, fun, light-hearted reads. I like them a lot. I really want to read his Egyptian mythology series. The... what's that? The Something Cain ones, I think? I've not read them yet, but I want to. Um, and... Yeah, I just quite enjoy all mythology in general. Um, Norse mythology is something I'm a big fan of. I really, really enjoy that. I've got a few really interesting books on the topic. That, again, they're just like, they're quite nice to read and fall asleep to because they're simple, but they're also not because there's all these deeper meanings to the stories and all this other stuff going on. And I really like that. I like any story with like Freya and I find that really cool. Yeah, I like... I like mythology. It's quite good. It's real good, isn't it? <laughs> um, where are we at with this? Ah, uh, non-green party candidates here, so the Lib Dems is. See, I've been wary about voting for Lib Dems since the whole Tory coalition, but I can see why you'd be more willing to vote for them now. That was a while ago. I've just not quite forgiven yet, you know? I got a pamphlet at the door a few rounds ago. Don't let the other parties tell you how to vote. Vote Labour. <laughs> Good sake. Um, I had quite a baby face too, but the worst thing was my mum said, it's high time you started using anti-wrinkle cream. You're almost 30. I'll be honest. I bought an anti-wrinkle cream the other day. Been, been using it on my problem areas. I think there's a difference though between like a person saying, hey, I want to use this product to make me feel better about myself or like just try and reduce some aging or tighten my skin a bit or whatever. And another person saying, oh, you're this age, you need to do it. You know, that's a bit douchey. If you decide for yourself, fine, all good, probably. Mm. Alice, you're completely right. Even if Green don't get in, more votes for them shows that people care about the environment and hopefully the two main parties will do a little bit more on that score. You're absolutely right. And it's not just their environmental policies that are great. They have way better social care policies than Labour on most fronts. Like, I, I really, really rate them. Um, who's the best Yorkshire writer or poet? And I have a soft spot for Simon Armitage. Always will. Always will. I think he's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, thank you. For good luck on your poem. Um, do you have... Words. Do you have any advice for getting out of a creative slump? Perfectionism makes it hard to start anything. Tell me about it. Um, Kane Chronicles. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I, I couldn't remember the name of the main character, though. Uh, what, what's his name? Something Kane. Well, we can Google it. That is not how you spell Chronicles. And these are not the books I thought they were. Ah, came with a K. There we go. Sadie and Carter Crane. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, they're the ones I still need to read. Um, where were we? So, advice for getting out of a creative slump. Perfectionism makes it harder to start anything. It's hard. 
I kind of wish I had better advice because sometimes I need this myself. But sometimes you need to realize that getting something done to any standard is better than not doing it at all, you know? And so this is the thing that I try and tell people when they're saying, like, I want to start a YouTube channel, but I want to start photography, but I want to start writing, but, and I'm like, just get it done. It's fine. Even if it's bad, you don't need to show it to anyone. You don't need to show anyone else until you're ready. Just enjoy the process of making and just have a go because the only way you get better and get good is by actually doing. Like if I show you some of my paintings from 10 years ago, you're not gonna recognize them compared to what they're like now. Like, and that, that's one of the things. I always thought I could never paint. I was bad at painting. And now I have these beautiful paintings and stuff all on my wall that I can't believe I painted. I mean, I'm not an expert, but how far I've come is insane because I just enjoyed the process of painting and I didn't show anyone for a really long time until I felt ready and confident enough. And it's the same with writing. I wrote for a really long time in secret and then I got ashamed and I stopped. And then I started making my poetry videos on YouTube and I fell back in love with writing again. And then when I felt ready, I showed people and the response was great. Um, but even if the response wasn't good, I could have used that to fuel me towards making my work better. Like I do have a couple of reviews on Amazon and stuff that aren't the best and that's okay, you know? Like there's a couple of people who are very much like, oh, you deserve this. It's so nice to like see you getting what you deserve after you've been so harsh to everyone else. And those really, really upset me at first. But then I realize it's because they're personal attacks. They're not attacks on my work, they're attacks on me. And I'm like, okay, they just don't like me, this is fine. But then I think, and this is gonna sound silly, one of my favorite reviews that I've gotten is this like one or two star review from this person who left a really, really detailed review about all these things she didn't like from my poems. And she went in and I was like, this is gold. This is really, really good. And I went through and there's a few bits I do dis disagree with. Like there's some bits where she didn't like my grammar because it wasn't standard English grammar and she didn't like this and this. I'm like, that's fine. That's just how we talk in Yorkshire. I'm not gonna give up my Yorkshire dialect for standard English, this is okay. And then there are a few bits where she was like, oh, okay, like this seems the most accomplished. This doesn't, I didn't like her repetition here. I didn't like, I'm like, oh, this is great. I can use this going forward. And so you kind of use that to propel you forward. And hopefully my next book is gonna be better. My next collection is gonna be better. And I'm just gonna keep going and keep working with it. But it does like, it's made me a lot more confident in myself because it also made me realize that I'm okay with standing up for my voice in some ways when I want to. So like her her thing about like not liking certain bits of my grammar and stuff, I'm like, that's fine. I'm fine to ignore that now. So now if I get that criticism again, it's not really gonna affect me in the same way because I'm like, this is a thing that I've thought about and been like, no, I wanna stick with my Yorkshire roots instead of correct standard grammar you know what I mean so it's a before the the Yorkshire dialect was a n natural kind of something natural that I flowed into now it's a conscious choice where I'm saying no I want to embrace this because this is my roots this is where I'm from things like um so in Yorkshire like if you talk about like when's a shop open we say nine more five you know stuff like that and that's not correct grammar in standard english you would say 9 a.m until 5 p.m in yorkshire we say nine more five wild doesn't make sense grammatically but it does in yorkshire so this is something that i want to embrace and kind of use more of and especially in the poems where i talk about my childhood and my background and where i'm from and where i live now it's something i want to embrace more and use more and it sounds silly, but like her pointing out that I don't like this made me think more about the grammar that, and the syntax that I'm, con con that I'm using and I wanna do it more consistently and I wanna do it more consciously. Then I got the words out eventually. <laughs> so even though it was a negative review, it really helped me. And yeah, all good. 
Oh, no way! 36 is the average age for an author to publish their first book. Damn. I just turned 30, um, less than a month ago, so I'm doing, doing okay. I'm feeling good about this. Oh, of course, Emily Bronte. I kind of forget about her as a Yorkshire poet, but of course. Damn, yeah. <laughs> I like that. You're never going to be everyone's cup of tea, so you might as well be your own cup of tea. I like that a lot. It is good. Yeah. I think that's the other thing to remember as well, is that, like, everyone has their own styles of writing and stuff that they enjoy and that they like. And in my writing, I do... Like, I'm still at a stage where I'm very new to writing and I have a hell of a lot to learn and a hell of a long way to go. And I'm very much trying to find my voice. And for some parts of that, that means emulating others' voices that I already like. And it means adapting their voices and stuff like that. And so if, for example, like my poem, uh, South Bank, is very much inspired by... Um, why has the name left me? Christina and... Um, hang on. This is wine brain, this is. Rossetti. There we go. So my poem South Bank is very much inspired by Christina Rossetti and the way she writes a lot about temptation and lust and excitement and anticipation. I took a lot of inspiration from her and her natural imagery for like fruits and food and eating and kind of like indulgence. I was really, really inspired by, by her. Which means if you like Christina Rossetti, you're probably going to like South Bank as a poem. But if you don't like Christina Rossetti, you're probably going to hate South Bank as a poem. So you kind of have to be aware of that as well. And like, I, I think Christina Rossetti is one of the best poets out there. But I also know a lot of people are going to hate her. So I think that's okay. It's kind of one of those things you learn to, I don't want to say overcome, but you learn to learn from. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Ah, see, Ted, Ted Hughes is pretty decent, but he's not my favourite. Yes, yeah, see, Goblin Market is amazing, but also she wrote some of the most beautiful sonnets. And um, let me see. Uh, sorry, I've got one of her books down here. Give me a second. Sorry, I had to go all the way around. I pulled this chair over for Kyra before. And he's just been sleeping for the last hour, like a little bean. Ah, so yeah, I got this amazing like collection of Christina Rossetti poems, and let's see what I have highlighted. Ah, so... Dream Love is nice. What else have we got? Ah, Goblin Market, of course. Um, I haven't really got much marked in this. I feel like I need to spend more time with it. Hmm. Dream Love is nice, it's one of my favourites, but it's a little long to read. Um, you have a song though. When I am dead, my dearest, sing no sad songs for me. Plant thou no roses at my head, nor shady cypress tree. Be the green grass above me, with showers and dewdrops wet. And if thou wilt remember, if thou wilt forget. I shall not see the shadows, I shall not feel the rain, I shall not hear the nightingale. Sing on, as if in pain, and dreaming through the twilight, that doth not rise nor set. Happily I may remember, and happily may forget. She's just brilliant. If I can write either like, even like a quarter as many good poems as her before I die, I'll be happy. <laughs> God. It's 
sometimes I look at books like this and I'm like, that's a lot to live up to. Hmm. I have got, if you're into Yorkshire poets and stuff though, I've got a great book about, so I'm going to lean over. I'm going to try not to just like flash you my bum, but give me a second. This is a fantastic collection. This is the Valley Press Anthology of Yorkshire Poetry, which is all poetry about Yorkshire and written in Yorkshire. And there's some really, really great stuff in here. So let me read you some of the poets in this collection uh, who you might know. You've got Matt Black, Jane Sharp, Ian McMillan, Andrew McMillan, uh, Kate Fox. Uh, that's you. Ian Duig. Who might you know? Wendy Pratt. Oh, you have a Caroline Duffy poem in here as well. Yeah. Tons of people. Let me see what I've got folded over in here. Nobody hurries in Harrogate. I've spoken about that in a video before. Uh, I think I got marked. I think what else is good. There's a couple of poems about Hull being horrific because it is. Stuff about Sheffield. Quite a few at Sheffield. Have you got any Barnsley ones in here? Have you got a. I got the. Give me some Barnsley. Barnsley. <gasps> Barnsley boundary walk over Woodhead. I know that. By Jane Sharp. <laughs> it's not a place for plimsolls or flip-flops, yet the red hyphenated line squiggling across the page makes it look an easy ramble along an ancient bridle way. Langsit, Dunford Bridge, over a flat patchwork of moor, ignoring the contours. It beckons a rucksack full of sandwiches, a hot flask, chocolate for emergencies, cargo pants stuffed with wet wipes, tissues, aspirins, and a pocket full of loose change for a pint of best bitter at the end. Reality is... I'm struggling a bog. A living colossus of roads, carefully moving clump to clump over a peaty mire, like Ronwald's ghost slogging home, my head ramming into a blustery northwest wind. There's a thrum of traffic in the distance, growling up Woodhead, massed by a howling gale force, my waterproof jacket inflates, a hovercraft skirt ready to move me over the tussocks of tusted hair grass, and, a, and high in the sky an eye watches, waiting for boots to squelch in the quagmire, for oozing mud to trap me in a fold. Of gallows moss on the rise, a sharp shriek tugs me backwards, gets inside my ears, reins me in. I can see the chain on a page, meander past a uh, wind-leading res reservoir. That's a place I don't know and I've never been. I can feel it bruise my ankles. The eye still watching, waiting, pins me to a patch of purple heather, and in the distance... A sign points to the middle of nowhere. It's great. It's very Yorkshire. I love it. Ah, that's where I live. That's where I grew up. All that stuff. Yeah. Christina Rossetti is very Christina Rossetti's very good. I like a song in the bleak midwinter. Christina Rossetti has some beautiful poems about grief that really move me. She's amazing. She's genius. Mm. Excellent. Um, how are we for questions? Okay, yeah, no more to answer. It's all good. <sighs> we got this. That's a good question, Mitchell. What is Rachel doing now? Reading poetry. Or I was. Or I will. Or I shall. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking of doing another open mic night. Not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday after. 
we'll see. I'm quite nervous. I think it'll be good. We'll see how it goes. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> so I've all grown to be a No, shush, what? No, we spent a long time talking about books, okay? I'm going to bed soon. I'm going to bed soon. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding Keats? Honestly, I am not the most familiar, to be honest. Um, I probably know some John Keats poems, but probably know more than the popular ones. <sighs> yeah. I'm a bit take it or leave it. I'm I'm very like I don't know wary of rich white men writing poems. Unless they're Oscar Wilde. <laughs> Are you guys gonna judge me if I take my makeup off now because I'm quite tired and it's late and why not? You know? I will probably end this in like twenty minutes or so, so I'm gonna take my makeup off now because I'm very, very tired and you guys have seen my face before. Um, would you read some of my poetry if I emailed it to you? <laughs> See that, it's hard. I try and like read all the stuff that's emailed to me, but I don't get a chance to like reply to people and stuff because I get so much to send to me. It's impossible to read it all and keep up on top of it and know who to prioritize and who to not. And it's just, it gets a bit of a nightmare. Um, and also I find that it's hard to give feedback on stuff like that because I can't be objective because if someone's my fans, if someone is my fan or watches me, I feel like I owe them something and I can't be objective and it's just... <sighs> I find it hard. I find it very hard. And so I try and avoid re reviewing the work of people who like mine. Because it just kind of makes it more complicated and difficult and, you know... Oh, Charity says, when do you think you'll do another video on your art channel? I've really enjoyed watching them. Oh, thank you. So I do want to do another one soon of one of my, like, watercolour insects um, and video it. But I've just been quite nervous. I just, I feel like, I don't know. I got in my head a bit and I felt like my art wasn't good enough. My filming of my art wasn't good enough. I wasn't good enough. It's hard. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll get there. I'd like to make more soon. And I've been drawing more recently and painting more recently, which is really good, so. Yeah. Aw, Michael says, I was going to say I'd been hanging out with you guys for the first time on your stream. Aw, well, thank you for being here. We appreciated it, and it's been fun you being here. Uh, do you watch any booktubers? Any recommendations? Um, I don't know about booktubers specifically. I'm not sure who counts as a booktuber. Um, even though I'm friends with her, I'm a big fan of Alizi and her book reviews. Um, I've been watching Elise since, well, we became friends because I was a big fan of her videos. <laughs> and I was like, do you want to get coffee? <laughs> and she said yes, and we've been friends ever since. Um, I really like Savvy Writes books. I like her book reviews a lot. Um, I like when she talks about books and anti-MLM stuff, which, you know, I'm also a big fan of, and all of that stuff. So, um, I don't know if she counts as a booktuber, though. Maybe she does. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, mm, mm, mm. Who counts as a booktuber? Not sure. I don't really watch anything like TikTok or... TikTok. <laughs> I feel too old for TikTok. I feel like... I don't know, I don't really fit in so much. I've got into a weird place recently of watching videos about Broadway play drama and I'm really really enjoying it so I've been watching all this stuff about the whole like Cinderella bad Cinderella Broadway drama I've been watching stuff about oh who's that person I really like who she's quite a small channel but she's great I mean not that small she's a mid-sized channel um Oh my god, I have like 600 people I'm subscribed to. How am I going to find her? Someone who makes... videos. That doesn't help. Um, I'll tell you who I love. Hannah Bales and her singing review videos. I love Hannah Bales. Great. Wonderful. Love her. 
want to be her friend. Um, who am I thinking of? Seriously, yesterday I had like three of her videos pop up in my home feed and now I've got none. Where is she? Who is she? Hmm. Is it you? No, it's not you. I can't even think of her name. Not very helpful at all, is it? Maybe I'll just Google the play. Is this her? <gasps> this is her! Ashley Norton! I really like Ashley Norton. Not a booktuber, but um, she's making some great videos that I've watched a lot of recently. I watched her Debbie Ryan Making History Celebrity Deep Dive. I watched her Excruciating Taylor Bad Cinderella. I watched her The Fever Dreams era of YouTuber tours. Um, I've watched her Life and Scandals of Bella Thorne. <laughs> um, I've watched quite a few of her videos. She's great. I really like her. How does she not have more subscribers than she does? She's got like 78,000 subscribers and she needs so many more. She's great. Mm. Isaac asks if Mio Kyra have ever read House of Leaves. Yes, I really like House of Leaves. I read it... Um, just after I got Kyra, about like nine months after I adopted her, and I really, really like it. It's a book that I reference quite a bit, actually. It's so atmospheric, it really gets in your head, it messes with your head. I love it. I love that book. Great. Um, where are we at? Did you watch Han's reaction to you on some other feeling yet? I remember it came up on the last stream. Uh, some other thing. Oh my god! The Buffy episode, of course! No! Oh my god, I've still not seen that! Oh, no, but I love, I love Hannah's stuff. Um, I've not seen her latest videos. The last one of hers I watched was the <laughs> one about the search for Elle Woods Broadway, re Broadway reality show. Then I saw the Into the Woods reaction. Cats. Cats scares me anyway because the makeup. There's something about people in animal makeup that terrifies me and I hate it and I think I've gone on a rant about this in live streams before but it creeps me out so much. Um, I saw her react to the Whitney Houston. Oh my god, I've watched so many of her videos. I've seen her reaction to Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Live Action Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast with Emma Watson. Didn't watch the burlesque one yet or the Miley Cyrus one. Um, I've seen all her reactions to like all the Descendants films and stuff like that, even though I've never seen those films. I've watched all of the reactions to the Pitch Perfect films. <laughs> I'm such a Hannah Bales fan girl. <laughs> it's only a little bit embarrassing, okay? Uh, what was the last book on atheism slash philosophy you read? Ooh, I honestly don't know. That's hard to say. I'm not, I don't know. I don't really read books on straight philosophy very often. I don't mind it if it's like intertwined with other things, like it makes you think about philosophy and stuff while telling a story or while telling other issues, but Honestly, I find about I find that like a lot of people who write about like straight philosophy and stuff just end up coming across something douchey. But she didn't say that. I actually um, I'm not sure I quite class him as like atheism, but I really like Bart Ehrman's books on basically ripping apart the Bible and talking about like why certain bits were ripped. I mean, he doesn't set out to rip apart the Bible, but that's basically what he does. He talks about like why certain bits of the Bible were written, the contradictions in the Bible, all these different like technical aspects of it and stuff and the history of it. I found it really interesting. I, I really like Bart Ehrman's writing. Um, I don't know anything about him otherwise, but I like his books. Um, I love all Possum's Book of Cats, but I hate the musical. I, yes. Yes, me too. I've actually got the, um, where's the dog one? Old 
sorry, I'm not being weird. My poetry shelf is down here. Give me one second. I've got his dog one. My sister got me for my birthday this year and it was great. Literally bottom shelf, bottom corner. Also, I am wearing shorts. I'm not being weird. Sorry. I realised how that looked when I came back. Old Toffer's book of consequential dogs. This is an amazing book. I love this. Um, so the cat version of this is what the musical Cats was based on, which is quite interesting. Um, but the dog one's even better. Ah. Uh, You guys, quick ruin challenge. <laughs> okay. This is Dobson, the dog detective. Universally acknowledged as a hero of our time, Dobson, the dog detective, sworn enemy of crime, uses his own odd methods to nab and bring to book villains of every type, from mastermind to petty crook. Police dogs play a vital role in criminal detection with their superior powers of olfactory inspection. Not to mention four-legged running, a trick we suddenly lack, and employing jaws and teeth to drag, to drag escaping wrongs back. Dobson, by striking contrast, spends all day in his bed. Slumped there motionlessly, you might well think him dead, till a snuffle or a wheeze disturbs his very ample frame. And you know the clever fellow has in mind a different game. There was a time when Dobson, as a young and eager beagle, dashed out with the other dogs in hot pursuit of the illegal, and thereby helped to catch his share of bent and shady types, doggedly, yes, and dutifully earning his sergeant's stripes. When, after further service, he rose to be inspector, his behaviour underwent a change that could easily have wrecked, or at least called into question, a lesser dog's career. I'm off to bed, he told them, and I'll be staying there. Though he has rarely left it since. There was never cause for worry. He does things in his own sweet time. You cannot make him hurry. Days, weeks, and months pass in a doze. Then suddenly he'll cry. I know not just who did the deed, but how and when and why. His mighty and mysterious brain has been active all along. And what is quite extraordinary, he never gets things wrong. The most ingenious criminals, cats to a large degree, thanks to Dobson and his dozing, are now under lock and key. So when a crime's uncovered and the force is in a rush, to identify the culprit, please don't disturb his hush. If you see his blanket slipping, gently put it back in place and step away on tiptoe because Dobson's on the case. <laughs> this is so cute. I love this book so much. It's so cute. Ooh. Adorable. Excellent. 10 out of 10. Thoroughly recommend. Yeah, the old possum one is T.S. Eliot, right? Yeah, T.S. Eliot. This one, I believe, was, like, inspired by it, but by a different poet, I think. I want to say, unless I'm making it up. Which I could be. You never know. You never know. So 
Dr. Chris Reed, who wrote this, was the editor at Paper and Faber, where T.S. Eliot once worked, which is why he's not only inspired by him, but he's had similar jobs to him. Makes sense. Sensey, sensey, sense. Hmm. Aw, you guys are nice. Because I just came back from a break and happy to see this is still going. Don't know what time it is in the UK, but I guess it's pretty late there. It is coming up to 11, so I think I should probably head to bed soon because my small one is snoozing. My makeup is gone. As is my wine. No, I'm joking, there's still like half a bottle left. But still. <laughs> hmm. I have had a very fun time tonight. Thank you all very much. I'm just going to double check, see if there's any more questions or anything like that. No, we're good. We are on top of them all. Let's end that. How do I make this work? There we go. Um, but yeah, thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you for letting me talk about books. Thank you for letting me remove my makeup and look like this. <laughs> that was my makeup free face. A little bit unhinged, I know. Um, it's 3 p.m. there. 5 p.m. in Texas. Is Kara throwing like white noise to you? Yeah, you just like, you get used to it, you know? And I like her noises in the background and when she's not here, I miss her. And I'm like, you're too quiet without her. I'm like a child. You miss my teddy bear. Except my teddy bear's alive and cuddles me back. I wish you guys could see more than her bum right now, because where is she? There she is. There I'll be. There she I'll be. I love her. I love her very much. Um, but yeah, anyway. Oh god, it's been a while. What is this? Four hours? Big long stream, I think. Wait, YouTube will tell me. Wait. Will YouTube tell me? Analytics. An average view. Chat rate, views, viewer activity. But can you tell me how long I... Oh, okay. Yeah, we're coming to four hours. Wonderful. Amazing. Oh, okay, I'm going to go get into bed and maybe watch some TV with my coops. Maybe read a book. I'm finishing uh, Siege and Storm at the minute. The second one in the Shadow and Bone series. The whole, like, Grisha trilogy. And I'm enjoying it. It's, it's good. Good so far. Like I say, I need more Darkling. Mostly I need more Ben Barnes, but I think everyone needs more Ben Barnes in their life. Because Ben Barnes. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you all for watching tonight, it's been great. Um, don't, don't really know what else to say other than thank you, and I appreciate you guys. And I hope my bare face doesn't scare you too much. So, um, thank you, and good night, and... I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Also, I have more videos coming out soon. I have a video on Steven Crowder that's going to be out very soon, so keep an eye out for that. My script is pretty much done now. I just need to film, so that's my job for tomorrow. That's the whole situation. Anyway, good night, everyone. You're wonderful, and I will see you all again very soon. And...